keys in these two sessions that I have applied to my life and I use them every day in order to accomplish personal success and how to experience kingdom prosperity. I'm going to focus on succeeding in times of crisis. How do you become successful when everybody else is crumbling around you? How do you make it through the system when the system has spat you out? What do you do when you are no longer needed by a company? What do you do when you lose your income? What do you do when nothing seems to work out and you're losing your car and your house and, and your sanity? What do you do when there's not enough to take care of your daily obligations? How do you handle the crisis of life when life hits you on the blind side and you didn't expect things to go the way they went? What do you do when even friends abandon you and can't help you? Uh, or when your company has to be shut down or, or when you lose a business? What do you do when there's so much pressing on you from creditors? How do you survive when you've been working on a job for 20, 30 years and then they lay you off? And now you're too old to even start a new skill. What do you do when the insurance company doesn't want to insure you anymore because they are assuming that your age doesn't benefit their policy principles? What do you do when sickness ravages your body and the bills of medical attention is eating away at your own family's legacy? What do you do when you gotta take your kids out of private school and put them in public school? What do you do when you have so much stress in your marriage because of financial problems that it's causing you to have difficult times sleeping with your spouse. Crisis. Let's talk about crisis for a minute. I have a picture up here of a crisis. It's a hurricane. Americans call it a tornado. A hurricane is really a massive tornado. When a hurricane comes, we call it a crisis. Why is a hurricane a crisis? Why is a tornado a crisis? Why is a tsunami a crisis? Why is a snowstorm a crisis? The answer is because a crisis is really circumstances that occur that you have no control over and you didn't cause them. If you lost your job because they laid you off, you can't control that. If your company is not having the kind of customers or the clients have fallen off and you can't make enough money to keep things going, you have to shut it down, that's a crisis. You can't control people coming or not coming to patronize your company. What do you do? Well, a crisis is an institutional circumstances of either nature or the environment or the system that attacks your equilibrium. But there are some good things about a crisis. The world is in crisis right now. The economy of all the countries in the world seem to be under great turmoil. And in your nation and in the Bahamas here where I live, there's no different. People are having difficulty making it. But I come with good news today. I want you to follow me very carefully on what to do in the midst of that crisis. There's some things that you can do that are based on the kingdom system that will give you the success and the prosperity that you need in the midst of that crisis. A couple of things about crisis to write down. Number one, crisis is to incubate of creativity. Most of the time, we're not creative until something bad happens to us. When things fall apart, it makes us think outside the box. Secondly, crisis demands a new way of thinking about old problems. An old problem is you got to pay a mortgage. The problem is the source of income that you used to pay it with has been dried up. But the old problem hasn't gone away. You still got to pay a mortgage. So what you got to do is let's find a new way to generate income to pay the old problem. So crisis actually forces you to think about new ways to solving old problems. Thirdly, crisis is an opportunity to improve and advance over old ideas. 
Sometimes the only way for you to move on is for something to happen to push you. And many times we don't grow until we have to. So crisis comes many times to improve us because we've been stuck in a place too long. And number five, crisis comes also to produce growth. And it also produces a sense of development. It makes you develop new approaches to life. Crisis creates new opportunities. It's amazing when, when we uh, look at the world today, every progressive invention came out of a problem. And that's because crisis makes you develop and think in new ways. Number seven is very important. Crisis produces and manifests true leadership ability. No matter how much you would like to claim to be a leader, only crisis proves it. You are not really a leader in good times. Anybody can lead in good times. Leadership is tested and proven when there is a crisis environment. So crisis comes to test to see if you are as mature as you claim to be. You've been telling people how good God has been. Let's see how good he is when things fall apart. You've been telling me how much faith you got. Well, let's see what kind of faith you have when there has to be situations where things don't look too good and you're not sure how you're going to make it in the morning. In other words, crisis comes to test your leadership ability. Another uh, definition of crisis is that crisis ignites the passion for a renewed vision for your life. Crisis takes you back to what God told you from the beginning. Sometimes you stray away and God got to pull the rug from under you to get you back on the floor. And many times a crisis will take you back to the original idea that God told you from the beginning and it's called your original vision. And this is one of the good things about a crisis. It takes you back to your passion. Now, I want to therefore talk a little bit about the benefits of crisis. There's a statement made by Shakespeare. You all know Shakespeare, the great playwright. Shakespeare said these words. I love it. He says, sweet are the uses of adversity. Say that with me. Sweet are the uses of adversity. That's a deep statement. In other words, he's telling us when things are adverse, when things are in crisis, don't panic. Use them. Use them for the positive result. Everything that happens to you could be used to produce something good. That's amazing. Everything. So Shakespeare caught on to something. He realized in his own thinking that adversity can be used to benefit the one under the adversity. The richest man, one of the richest men in America, his name is John Huntsman. John Huntsman is the founder of one of the largest companies in the United States, and they produce about 90% of all the plastics, forks, and spoons that you use in your house or at your parties. This company is the one, this is like the number one company in the world that produces plastic plates and, and plastic cups. This, this is the company here. It's owned by this man. His company fell into debt, and his company actually collapsed some years ago. And he went into a crisis mode, and he went to the bank. The bank said they ain't loaning no more money, and his company went into bankruptcy. He went home and told his wife, I quit. I'm never going to start this company again. I'm going to go find me a job. It's over. His wife said to him, honey, you told me that this idea was given to you by God and that you going to build this and make it successful. You, that's why I married you. I believe you. Now, if you're going to do this, go back and start again. He said his wife made him go back and ask another bank. He left the old bank. And he showed the bank the truth. He said, here's what I did in the last 15 years. Here's what happened. And I could start again. I know how to build a business. Will you trust me? And the bank says, I'll take a chance on you. He had no credibility, no assets, just a record that he built a company. The bank took a chance on him. And he began to start the company again. Today, the company is worth over $14 billion. He ran for the president of the United States during the time of Obama. You remember this man's name. He's one of the candidates for the president of the United States. 
billionaire. Here's what he said as a result of his crisis. I quote, if there is a silver lining to bad times, it is this. When facing severe challenges, your mind is normally at its sharpest. End quote. Now look at the statements in that statement. He said, when you are under the biggest pressure, that is when your mind is normally at its sharpest. Because your mind is having to think of things it never thought of before. Another quote I got from him is this one. He said, humans seldom have created anything of lasting value unless they were tried or hurting. He was talking from experience. He said, we don't produce anything that's worth talking about unless we are under pressure. You know, people respect Bahamas Faith Ministries because we used to be called a cult and we survived that. We used to be called a place where we stole people's money and we survived that. We used to be called a, a kind of a passing in the night phenomenon that won't last and we survived that. In other words, you are never trusted for the things you claim. You are always trusted for the things you survived. It is the test that creates credibility. Write it down. It is the test that creates trust. So if you're going through a bankruptcy moment, that's your test of being trusted on the other side of the crisis. In other words, you never think that a crisis comes to conclude your life. It comes to give credibility to your life. Whatever you are making through the troubles right now, what you're going through is going to give you the respect of other people observing you. There are people who are praying that you fail and then they'll trust you when you don't. Weird people in the world. They hope you won't make it and when you make it, they congratulate you. So therefore, don't listen to the naysayers. Accept the test as part of you becoming a successful person. Successful people are always survival testimonies. They weren't born successful. Success is a result of going through a furnace, sleeping with lions, being torn apart, being ripped apart, being criticized and attacked. Success is what people think of you after they try to kill you. This is success. Matter of fact, let me just put it this way. Let me define a crisis in detail for you. A crisis is literally a circumstances or an event or a situation affecting you and also affecting your environment over which you have no cause, you didn't cause it, and you also have no direct reason for it being against you and you are victimized by it. You're not responsible for it. If you get fired from your job, that's a crisis. If you were told by a doctor that you got a, a, a cyst in your womb, that's a crisis. You didn't cause it. The doctor said you got a, 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 a growth in your, in, your, in your uterus or you got a growth in your breast or you got a growth in your brain. That's a crisis. You didn't know it was there. You didn't cause it. If someone says to you, well, you know, uh, uh, we're going to have to withdraw the overdraft from you because, you know, you don't qualify anymore. Well, you tried all these years. Now you're a victim of the system. What do you do? A crisis is simply unplanned and uncontrolled change. A crisis is something that you didn't plan on, but it happened. I think that the greatest fear today, the greatest crisis right now in our whole world is the loss of a job. The ability to financially secure yourself. People are afraid of losing their jobs. Some have already done so. As I travel around the world, I've seen thousands of people who literally have lost their homes. I just came back from Orlando and they got rows of million dollar homes with for sale signs in a gated community. I drove through there and I said, my God. They say, yes, people are having to move out because they cannot keep up with the mortgage and the system has collapsed, the bubble has burst, and we got people who had millions of dollars are now sleeping in apartments with two bedrooms. Why? Because the system, unplanned change, a crisis. Sometimes you think you got it bad, but believe me, uh, the, the poor man don't know what they're talking about when they say crisis. 
A man who is broke to know that he is to have no money. It's those who have plenty that hurt the worst. The crisis is hitting everybody. That's my point. But write this down, please. This is very important. And that is this. The fear of losing the job is the greatest concern today. And I want to talk about this because that's what the Lord told me to talk about in these two sessions. To check your concept of job. Because that is where the problem lies. Our economic psychology has made us dependent on jobs. And that has become our curse. Because a job is really an opportunity someone else offers you. And if somebody offers you an opportunity, they can always take it back. And if you build your life on someone else's offer, you are as safe as how they feel at the time. And they can change the way they feel anytime and withdraw the offer. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That's why you can't build your life on a job. Stay with me. I'm going to help you with this here. One of the good things about a crisis, if you lost your job, if your business shut down, if you got to withdraw your investments or you had to sell some property or things ain't working out, there's a good side to these kinds of things. Every test is temporary. Say that with me. Every test, shout it loud. Give someone a high five. Tell them every test is temporary. I'm going to say it loud. Every test is temporary. Say it with some feeling. Every test is temporary. Clap your hands. That's the truth. So no matter what you're facing, don't panic too long. <laughs> you may panic for a minute, but I've come to tell you, the panicking time is over now because you're going to get some wisdom. Nothing is permanent except God and his promises. Everything else is changing. As a matter of fact, God promises us that nothing will remain the same. He promised that. Now, God doesn't change. His promise doesn't change. And here's one of his promises. He said in Ezekiel, Ecclesiastes, rather, chapter 3, he says, to everything there is only a season. And to every purpose there is a time under heaven. In other words, everything that you experience is only seasonal. If you broke now, it's only a seasonal brokenness. You're about to move into a lot of income. Tell your neighbor, I'm only passing through a tough moment. Give someone a shout right there. I'm only passing through a tough moment. To everything there is what? A season. You got a bad time in your marriage? Last, outlast it, it's going to come good in a little while. In other words, your insane wife going to come back to sanity when the season is over. Your husband is temporarily weird. He's going to come back soon. In other words, your kids are acting crazy now, but it's a seasonal insanity. Nothing, Jesus says, is forever. So if your company had to die, he's going to be resurrected. Come on, Mr. Huntsman, talk to me. I'm telling you, if your business failed, I've come to tell you, bury it, have a good funeral, and then get ready for a resurrection. Tell them, I'll be back. Why? Because everything is only for a season. If they fire you, they're going to be sorry later. They're going to try to hire you again when the season change. But you can have your own company by then. You can start hiring them. It's a season for everything. Can I hear an amen in the place? Am I talking to myself this morning? To everything. There's a season. So they laid you off, write them a letter. Say, thank you very much for letting me enter a new season. I'll be back. This is one of the most important things I learned. Because we're all running a race. Let me show you something here. It's very important here. Crisis demand new patterns of thinking. That's why they come. As a matter of fact, crisis creates new solutions. When things fall apart, you've got to find another way to solve them. See, the problem with humanity is we are creatures of habit. We have a habit of going to work. And all of a sudden, you ain't got no work. You're still going to work. There are folks who get to put their clothes on for God they got fired. And they drive past the place up and down, you know, just looking at the place. Hey, you are fired, okay? Break the pattern. We got a pattern of being broke. 
So we even get money being spent just to make sure we are broke. It's a pattern. But crisis comes to break the pattern. Write this down. Crisis initiates new concepts. It also renews our vision. It cancels experience. This one is important. When a crisis comes, your experience becomes useless. This is why the most silent voices today are the economists. They are saying nothing right now. For the last five years, the economists have said nothing. They've made no recommendations. You know why? Every principle they ever taught them in school has been canceled. The economy that is now existing never existed before. They never saw a country become bankrupt. They never saw a failed government before. What do you do when nothing you learned is working? A crisis comes to cancel that. And that, this is why I think, you know, I, I've been taught, like many of you, my parents were so nice. They said, children, go to school, get an education. And then they would say, experience is the best teacher. Well, that's not always true. Experience can be your worst enemy. Because if you got experience in doing something a certain way, and the environment changed, your experience becomes your enemy. Well, I never had to do this certain job before. Yeah, but you broke now. You better learn to do it. <laughs> well, I got a lot of experience in banking. Yeah, but ain't no bank hiring right now. You got to go work in the hotel. I got a lot of experience in, in hotel. Yeah, but hotels ain't hiring. You better go learn to be a gardener. Come on, don't look at me that way. See, your experience is destroyed by crisis. Sometimes we become so hooked on our experience, we wait until we find something that can use our experience and nothing wants your experience. You have to almost retool yourself sometimes. You gotta relearn things, you gotta, you gotta learn new skills, why? Because life has a way of shaking things loose. There are people right now who are so proud they are starving. I can't get that job. That's below me. Oh, yeah? You, you better get that job. Take that job that's available. We're going to soon bury you below the ground if you don't get your act together and put your pride in your pocket. If a job opens up, tell them, I'm going to take it for a season. Clap, man. Some of y'all get, get your head right. See, Jesus was temporarily a carpenter. He always knew he was the savior of the world, but for that period of time, he had to work in a job, but that wasn't his work. Sometimes you got to take a job so you can survive and take and work on your work. This is no season for you to have your pride to the point where you're starving your children. Dressing up and ain't going nowhere. Driving on a car on E, trying to pretend everything's cool, and then bumming money from people. You better go get yourself a job until you get your work back. Oh boy, it's getting quiet. Some of y'all ain't clapping, but that's all right. <laughs> Crisis manifest and express if you are a true leader and true leaders will do anything like be a carpenter until it's time to become the savior your job doesn't define you you are bigger than the job you get so enjoy it why you are passing through that job you ain't going to that job that's not your destiny that's a temporary location for you to learn some things and they pay you to learn while you're on your way to greatness this is why you should never despise a job crisis demands innovative thinking makes you think in ways you never thought before young people coming out of college looking for a job some of you all tried to stay in the US they broke you come back home, we broke. What are you going to do? Become innovative. This is very important. I'm going to show you something here. I want to talk about success. This is how we need to fix our definitions here. 
please write down every statement. Everyone wants to be successful. I've never met anybody who planned to fail. Every human wants to be successful, everybody. But I want to make it clear, success is predictable. Isn't that a weird statement? But you can predict success. Secondly, failure is also predictable. This is very, very important what I'm saying right now. There's no luck in success. That's why you can't be successful playing the lottery. Success is what? Predictable. So is failure. Now how can be these two important things be predictable? Here's why. Because everything in life was designed to function by laws. And laws make everything predictable. Hmm. Let me give you an example. Your car was built to operate on the law of unleaded gasoline. That's a law built into the car. If you were to put grade A Florida orange juice, expensive orange juice in your car, it's tank. What have you done? Broken the law. If you put five gallons of orange juice in your gas tank, can I prophesy that you will not have a car functioning? Can I? Can I predict then? How can I predict it? What, did I, what, what happened? You violated the law. So success and failure are not mysterious. They are both results of law. That leads to point number six. God designed your life to be successful. He designed it to be successful. I'm going to show you in a minute why. Everything God created, he designed it to be successful. Everything. The roach, the rat, the seed, the fish, the birds, everything God created. The atom, the maggot, everything God created, he designed it to be successful. And there's a reason why. At least the point number seven, your success is good for God. Say that with me. My success is good for God. Say it again. This is very, very important. When I discovered this, I was a teenager. This is one of the things that changed my life. I discovered this reading the Bible myself as a 17-year-old teenager. I discovered that God needs me to succeed. Let me explain why. Write this down. The success of a product protects the reputation of the manufacturer. I'm going to say it again. The success of a product does what? Protects the reputation or the name of the manufacturer. When I discovered that principle, I put pressure on God. You see, a product carries with it the entire credibility of the manufacturer. Everything created by a manufacturer, before it leaves the factory, the last thing they put on it is their name. You got an iPad, you see Apple on it. Apple is the name of the company that produced this. Your shoe has the name of the company. Your blouse, your shirt has the name of the company. The pen in your hand has the name of a company. Every product carries the company's name. Write the word name down, please. I want to tell you what the word name in Hebrew means, name. 
It means being. B-E-I-N-G. Being. Strange. In other words, in Hebrew, the name of a thing is the thing. This is why when Moses asked God, what is your name? It was a problem for God to answer. <laughs> Moses spoke in Hebrew. We don't know what kind of Hebrew it was, so don't try to speak Hebrew. Even Hebrew today in Israel is not the original Hebrew. Folks getting excited about these names of God and things. Listen, get settled down, okay? Even the name you got, Yahweh, ain't a real name. But anyhow, you settle down. Listen. He asked God, what is your name? God told Moses, well, I am what I am. That's what I am. God answered correctly. A name is not a label in Hebrew. Name is character. So God said to Moses, my name is, I am, whatever I am at the time. That's the way it's written. In, you know, if you translate it into English, it doesn't make sense. My name is whatever I am at the time. Call me that. What is your name? God says, it depends. It depends on what I am at the time. So Moses decided to write God's name the best he could. He wrote Yehovah blank. It's a blank. And you fill in the blank depending on what God becomes. For example, God doesn't heal people. He is Rafa. Yeah, I'm trying to talk God doesn't bring peace. He is Jehovah Shalom. God doesn't provide things for you. He is Jehovah Jireh. God doesn't give you wisdom. He is Jehovah Nisi. Are you getting this? So when you start saying you want to know the names of God, that's impossible. Because God becomes whatever you need him to be at the time. If you're sick, you don't need money. You need Rafa. So if you need healing, he becomes Jehovah Rafa to you. But the guy right next to you needs some money. He becomes Jehovah Jireh to that guy. So you got two manifestations of God's character in the same place. That same God became flesh and dwelt among us in a body called Yeshua, which means Joshua, which simply means Savior. And one time they asked him, what is your name? Who are you? His answer was, I've been telling you all along who I am, but you don't believe me. They said, no, you confuse us. Because on Monday you say, I am the light. And then on Tuesday you say, I am the way. And on Wednesday you say, I am the bread. And on Thursday you say, I am the water. He said, which one are you? It depends on what you need, he says. <laughs> Jesus became everything you need depending on what you need. So he says, I am, and he put in the blank, the light of the world. I am the water of life. I am the bread of life. I am the resurrection. I am the truth. I am the life. I am the way. I am the door. In other words, what do you need me to become? I become that. Name is being. I'm getting at something here. So when you put your name on something, you're putting your being on it. The word in the Hebrew for name is the same word for image. Write it down. Image is name. For example, Calvin Klein is an image. Hmm? 
Sean John is an image. You wear a person's image. <laughs> when God was in his factory producing you, the Bible says he said to himself, or three of himself, <laughs> Father, Word, Spirit. He says, let us produce a product. This ain't going to be like the birds, and ain't going to be like the dogs and the cats and the fish. This is going to be a unique product. We can put our name on this one. Let us make a species called man in our own image. That word is powerful. It means characteristic. We will put our stamp, our image on this creature. No angel was made in the image of God. When Michael sees you, he sees the very image, the character, the being of God. When Gabriel sees you, he sees the very character, the being of God. Let us make man in our own image. And likeness means he functions like us. Now why does God make you not just to have his characteristic, but also to function like him? Because God never fails. So God said, I can't afford for you to fail because I got my name on you. I'm about to show it right up here all by myself. Uh, I know you're using this. Let me borrow this for a second. These are, these are the cyber saints. I have in my hand a iPad. From the company called Apple. Now, when you bought this, it was in a box, sealed, film wrapped around it. When you opened it, the first thing you saw was not the product. They had it covered up with a, a book. And the book says, do not attempt to operate this product until you read me completely. How many of you read it completely? Let me see your hands. Don't tell lies in church. All right. See, no one reads that book completely. No one does. Forgive me too, Lord. All right. But if, if I want you to go back home and check the book. Because in the book, usually in the two last pages, you'll find something important. Every manual. First, it has a warranty page. Then it has... A guarantee page am I right you don't read them okay these are very important the most important pages in the whole document the warranty and the guarantee is the manufacturers promise that if anything doesn't work in this product they will replace it free of charge at their expense they say put it back in the box Ship it to us at our expense. We will pay the mailing. We'll ship you a new one back. They don't even know you. So don't think they like you. They ain't doing it because they like you. There must be some other motivation why they're so committed. Then they say, okay, if something goes wrong with this, in the first two years, we will replace everything free. We will send our authorized dealer to repair whatever is wrong and we will pay for it. They don't even know you. They said, if you open this up and there's any malfunction in this, we guarantee, we're a warranty by our company 
that we will make sure you get a brand new one replacement at no cost to you. They don't even know you. So why are they so dedicated to this? I'm going to say it slow. Why are they so dedicated to this? I didn't say to you. They don't know you. They are dedicated to their product because when you turn it over, their name is on the product. They don't know your name. They will pay any monies. They take their entire company and back up the product. They promise to send you an authorized dealer. They promise to send you genuine parts. And they even warn you, do not attempt to fix it yourself. Take a deep breath. That's a deep statement. In other words, no product should try to fix itself and no customer should try to fix another man's product. Why? Because the company is only interested in its name. So it wants its success to be tied to its name. The company knows that if anything fails in this product, their entire name, their reputation, their character is in trouble. So they will do anything. They say, ship it back to Canada. We'll pay. Why would they do that? Because success of the product is more important than the cost they have to pay. To restore the product, there's no expense spared. Why? Name. Image. You ever heard this? A company got a bad image. God says, let's put our name on this one. And then God says, now we are going to give this product a manual. The manual is simply the laws laid down by the manufacturer that ought to be followed to protect the product and to guarantee function. Laws are never to destroy a product. Laws are given to what? Protect the product. Why do we hate laws so much? We don't understand their purpose. They are to guarantee function. I can never be a failure in life anymore. Why? I know how to succeed. Why? I learned some laws. And that's why you're going to miss none of these sessions this week. Because you have to learn that coming out of a crisis is 100% law-based. Laws have no crisis. Gravity have no idea what's happening in your economy. Let me say it slow. Gravity doesn't care about the economy. You jump off a roof. Bad economy, good economy, no economy, gravity gonna pull you down. Get my point? In other words, laws don't respect laws of a government on earth. For example, God made your rectum with a law. It's an exit excretion point. That's a law, that's a biological law. Don't look at me. That's a biological, scientifically sound law. My hip is an exit. No legislation in any government can turn that into an entrance. The laws doesn't change the law. I just thought I'd throw that in in case some of y'all get a little excited about some things. Nature has no respect for any parliament. No. 
You can't vote to change nature's natural laws. Mm -mm. And God has built into his systems, including you, laws in the product that guarantees its function to protect his name. And that's why when you failed in Genesis 3, the manufacturer said, if I have to go down there by myself and die myself and spill my own blood, I will spare no expense to restore my product. Why? God didn't save you for him. I'm sorry, for you. Let me try it again. God didn't salvage you for your sake. All this stuff God is doing ain't for you. You think God blessing you? God ain't blessing you. He protecting his name. Listen, God is going to bring you out this week or whatever you have to face. Not because of you. I want you to get that, put it in your face and say, Lord, deliver me for your name's sake. Come on, say it like you believe it for the first time in your life. I don't know what you're facing this week, but tell God, don't do it for my sake. Do it for your own reputation. Put some pressure on him. Your success is good for God. If you fail, you embarrass the company. That's why he died on the cross, to protect his own name. That's why he rose again, to protect his own name. That's why he gave you the Holy Spirit, to protect his own name. That's why he lives with you every day through the Holy Spirit, protect his name. That's why he wants you to follow his laws, protect his own name. That's why he wants you to be righteous, to protect his own name. Because his name is on the line when you fail. Your success is good for God. Write this point down, please. Very important here. Success is not a pursuit. You remember I started by saying everybody wants to be successful. The problem is you are pursuing it. Successful people never try to be successful. <laughs> if you try to pursue success, it runs from you. Success is a result of obedience to laws. Hmm. A car doesn't try to run well. Just give it what it needs. That's all. And it runs well. You don't have to try to get your car to run well. It's not a pursuit. Just follow the laws of the engine. And it runs well. So it is with life. You're trying to be great, you'll never be great. You're trying to be successful, you'll never be successful. You're trying to be prosperous, it'll run from you. The Bible actually says, he who chases money, money takes wings. That's in the Bible. The more you run after it, the more it runs from you. Why? It doesn't happen that way. As a matter of fact, Jesus said something that is so weird. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteous laws and all of these things shall what? Be added unto you. They'll be chasing you. You attract things. I got a phone call this week from the, one of the, the chairman of the board of the NFL. This is the board. And the guy called me five times trying to get me. I called him back. I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I've been trying to get you for a while. I said, yes, sir. He said, look, uh, we are having some problems with NFL players. Uh, uh, they're having difficulties. And he talked about how their marriages are breaking up and how they're having difficulties in all the different areas. And, and he says, uh, you the man that we want to come in and talk to the NFL players. 
that happened two days ago. And I'm saying, I said, me? He said, yes. He said, we've, we have, we've read some of your material. We want to retain you as a consultant. He said, we're also going to write a book for NFL players for transitioning out of sports into natural, normal life. He said, we want to do at least three chapters in the book. We'll talk about royalties later. I said, yes, sir. Now, here's my point. Here's my point. I am still a Bain Town boy, living in an island seven miles wide. I didn't move to the U.S. to try to get a better job. It came looking for me from the highest level, and I wasn't even looking for it. All I'm doing is obeying the laws of God, obeying the laws of God, obeying the laws of God. And these things are at it. Success is a result of what? Obedience. Obedience to laws. I want you to learn that this week. Coming out of a crisis is a law issue. You know, my pilots flew me in this morning. And I, I appreciate Captain Thurston. You know, he, he teaches me so much. He said, Pastor Miles, when you get into a storm in an aircraft, he says, you go back to basics. You don't try to, to correct things in the aircraft. You go back to basics and get back to the laws of flying. He's just obeyed the laws and the plane gets itself out of the storm itself. Are you in a crisis? Don't panic. Go back to laws. Like tithing. Okay, God, I'm broke. Let me tithe. I got some orange. Let me give two oranges away. Why? Let me go back to basics. We become so sophisticated. You know, I got to try to work this out. I got to try to calculate what's going to happen. God says, look, just go back to basics. Bake a cake for someone and give it to them. A law. I want to show you this. I want to define success for you. First of all, let me tell you what success is not. Write this down. Success is not what you've done compared to what others have done. You'll always find someone dumber than you. You'll always find someone who can't run as fast as you. So don't try to compare yourself to anybody. You'll always have success against somebody else. So success is not what you've done compared to what I have done. That's not success, that's competition. So what is success? Success is what you've done compared to what you were created to do. How do you measure success? By what you've done compared to what you're being created to do. For example, if a bird that was created to fly never flies, that bird is a failure. But if that bird created to fly, flies, it is successful. So success is first of all, discovering what you're supposed to be doing. What you were born to do. What you were created to do. What is your gifting. And then forgetting competition. And pursuing, fulfilling that gift. That's success. And you do all in your might to keep pursuing, fulfilling the gift. Don't worry about success. Serve the gift. You know those four Bahamian boys who ran in the Olympics recently? You all only saw them on TV. You haven't seen their training habits, their eating habits. The oldest one among them tried to win a goal many times and failed, but he kept coming back. How about you coming back? That don't just happen. Do you know why we all love a winner? Because deep in our DNA, in the heart of our spirit being, is the spirit of a creature that knows how to succeed. And when we see it, it makes us identify with it. That's why we don't like to see people who come last. The good news is, you are here because you won.
<laughs> Do you know that when your mother and father went to bed, over 500 million sperms released by your father? Scientifically proven. Average 500 million. And they all dashed toward one egg in the woman. It was your mother. And those sperms were fighting to get there first. And guess who made it? You did. That means 499 million sperms lost the race because you won. You are here because you won. You're not here trying to win. Give yourself a hand, you winner, you. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor, I made it. I beat them all. I won the race. I begin as a runner. And I begin as a winner. Give God a hand for winning before you even start the race, huh? That's why you're here. Now you're here, you got to find out why did I come? That's where the success part is. And I got to figure out what, what is my gift? What is my assignment? What is my reason, my purpose for being here? Don't miss Wednesday night. We're going to talk about that. How to find it because that's success. Success is not in your job. Make a note of this, please. Success is the fulfillment of the purpose and the assignment for which you were created. A seed is only successful when it becomes a fruit-bearing tree. You know, if a seed becomes a tree, it's still not successful. It must bear fruit. And the fruit must have seed in it. A successful seed. In other words, if you only do half of your life, you're still not successful. If you only do some of what you're supposed to do, you're still not successful. We're supposed to die like the Apostle Paul. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I am like a, he says, I am like a, a drink offering. I've been poured out, he says. There's nothing left. That's success. Success is dying empty. Success is saying, I have done everything that I was set here to do. That's success. Please, friends, listen to me. Success is simply fulfillment and completion of your purpose. The purpose of a fish is to swim in the ocean and become one of the systems that actually cleanse the ocean. That fish swims. It has to swim to be successful. It's successful if it swims. That's why God made sure it could swim. Because he got to protect his name. He made the fish to swim, so the fish better swim. So he gave the fish the ability to swim. So that he could be successful. Ooh. Whatever you were born to do, he built into you the ability to do it for his name's sake. I come with good news this week. Your future is in the gift that he gave you. You know why we call it a gift? You didn't have to work for it. You, it came with the product. You know, when you look at this iPad, thank you, Pastor Pat, for a second. <laughs> this iPad got all kinds of stuff in it. It came with it. It came with everything needed to be an iPad. You ain't got to pray for nothing to be added to this. No fasting and prayer. It comes with it. When you came to this earth, you landed, boom. You came with everything necessary to fulfill your assignment. That's why going to university doesn't make you successful. You don't go to school to get your gift. Education cannot give you a gift. It refines your gift, but it can't give it to you. Your gift was built in by the manufacturer. That's why your gift must not be a victim of the economy. Crisis cannot destroy a gift. Crisis manifests gifts. Most gifts are buried on a career. I'm getting ahead of myself here. Most gifts are stuck in a job that you had for 40 years, buried in the graveyard of your career. That's why God fired you. 
to get your gift to be resurrected so you can start thinking about something else. Sometimes your job is your greatest enemy because it becomes the graveyard of your work. The problem with the Caribbean people is we've been built to be employed by government. This is one of the greatest curses upon our historical mentality. We look to the politician for our future. <laughs> Ooh. Excuse me. See, God never gave Adam a table. Never gave Adam a chair. <laughs> Never cooked a single meal for Adam. God hid the chair in the tree. Gave the man the tree. He said, work with that. I give you a brain with 500 billion cells. Use them, please. Stop looking at the government to bring you everything. Oh. This is why the curse of our region is consumerism. We consume, we don't produce. Producers are thinkers. Consumers are hoarders. That's why we import 90% of what we consume. We don't produce nothing, why? We are built to depend on the system to provide us employment. Maybe that's why the system ain't working. Maybe that's why the system is spit you out, spat you out. Because the system is saying, go think. Start up something on the inside. Let me show you something. Joshua. God said, Joshua, keep this law book on your lips. Joshua was a young guy, just like you, wanted to do something good in life. God said, here's the secret. Keep this book of the law on your lips. Meditate on it day and night. He says, and be careful to do everything written in it. And then he says, the result is this. You will make your way prosperous. And you will have good success. The two things you're trying to get are related to law. You think it's related to, you're related to work, hard work. And, no, 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 no. You can work hard and still be broke. Ask the person next to you. Don't look right, don't look right now. <laughs> it ain't hard work that does it. <laughs> slaves work hard. Study history. Slaves are hardworking people. They don't even own themselves. So working hard is not the secret. It's laws. If you keep my laws, meditate, talk about them on, the on your lips. He says, they will what? You will make your way prosperous. That means you make your own prosperity. Yes. By what? Doing the laws. I want you to forget about people talking about crisis anymore. Laws have no crisis. I'm going to teach you some laws this week to help you understand you can come out of anything. Sitting home in that house, you are not activating some laws that can make you prosper. Right in your own house. You got an oven that don't work except once a week. That's a sin. You only Use your car to go to work. Something wrong with that. You could serve some people with your car. 
pick an old lady up from the jerry. I have to take her every week, once a week. Use your car. It's, there's a law. He says, you will make your way prosperous. You have good success. Look at Jeremiah. God says, 29 verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, God says. Plans to prosper you. What kind of God is this? Now, why does he want you to prosper? Namesake. I plan for my product to prosper, he says. What else? Not to harm you. Why? Because my name is on you. I can't have a broken product. That's, that's bad for my reputation as a company. You know how I pray when I have a need? I say, Lord, this ain't good for you. I can tell everybody. <laughs> and the needs keep being met. You don't pray for your sake. I have a plan, he says, for you. A plan to prosper you, not to harm you. A plan to give you what? Hope. And I got to make sure you make it to the destiny. What's the destiny? The destiny of a bird is to fly. I got to make sure you make it to flight. The destiny of a seed is to become a tree with fruit. I got to make sure you make it to the fruit bearing stage. I have to make sure you make it to your end because my name is on the line. I've come to tell you in an announcement today with my whole spirit that God is going to make you successful for his name's sake. Before we go, just lift your hands and thank him for a couple of seconds. Just thank him for what he's about to do to bring you out for his name's sake. Just thank him for it for a minute. I know the plans I have for you, he says. Plans to prosper you. Plans not to harm you, but to give you hope. Hope is coming today. Hope. You coming out? Hope. 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 He's saying I'm coming out because of my name's sake. I'm going to fix this because of my reputation. I'm going to bring you out because of my name's sake. Give him some praise right here. I'm going to give you hope. Hope. I am hopeful because my future is inevitable. I will succeed because it's good for God. Look at this next verse, Ecclesiastes 10. It says, if the axe is dull, and its edge is unsharpened, then much strength is needed. You ever try to cut a tree down with a dull axe? The tree never gets hurt. Who gets hurt? You. Who works hard? You. Do you succeed? No. So working hard don't succeed? A dull axe is hard work, and the tree laughing at you? And all the callus building up in your hands, blood begin to form in your palms, and the tree is saying, what are you doing? If the axe is dull, much strength is needed. But I like the next statement. But with skill, ha, ah, success comes quickly. But with what? Skill. I looked at the word skill the Hebrew word. It means knowledge of laws. A skillful person is not a person who got a PhD. A skillful person is a person who know the laws. Your car stops running on the highway. You pull over on the side, you try to start it, and the car just makes a click. What do you do? First, you suck your teeth. That's Bahamian's first reaction. And then you begin to talk to the car. Some very interesting statements. This old, dumb, stupid car. See, he knows exactly what he's going to say. 
this crazy car. Why is this car so stupid? Always stopping at the wrong time. And you get into this whole argument. Third step, you walk out the car. You look at it. Then you kick it. You dumb, stupid car. So now you turn violent against the car. The car sitting there going, why are you talking to me? Why are you cussing at me? Why are you beating me up? I ain't done you nothing. You blaming me for your ignorance as to what's wrong with me. You don't know the laws by which I function, that's all. And because you don't know the laws by which I function, you are attacking me. And so somehow, some thought in your brain says, pick up your telephone, your cell phone, and call the mechanic. You call the mechanic, the mechanic arrives in 10 minutes, he shows up, he puts the problem. And you say, I don't know, this old dumb car wouldn't start. Mechanic, okay, no, no problem, go, 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 and go sit down in the car. Turn the key, click. He said, turn it again, click. He said, okay, I know what's wrong. Opens the hood, goes under there for about two minutes. He said, tie it again. <clears throat> he said, done. Now, you were there for two hours cussing. Two minutes, he's finished. What's the difference between... <laughs> I ain't getting the money yet. What's the difference between two hours and two minutes? Knowledge of skill. I've been working so hard trying to get my life right. Working so hard trying to get my life right. Trying working so hard to make it. I've been working so hard to make it. God said, look, you, you're kicking life. You're cussing at life. You need skill. Look at that verse again. If the ax is dull, that means you dull. You don't know how to fix this car. You dull. The guy with the skill walks up and he even can hear what's wrong. When you got laws, you can even smell what ain't going to work. Success is not luck. You got to make sure you keep obeying laws. When I counsel people, I would tell them, look, uh, you violated the law. And they're, they're looking, okay, listen, you want this marriage to work? You gotta, there's some laws. Ain't no magic. I can't pray for you to have a good marriage. There's some laws involved in this. Ain't no devil in this. Right. Your marriage got law problems. I was blaming the devil for things. Laws. If the axe is what? Dull. Much strength is needed with no success, but with skill. Success comes how? Even quickly. The guy said, two minutes, finish. Now the problem is when he's finished. <coughs> <coughs> See, you want prosper, okay? Prosperity comes from what? Laws. The guy brought some laws to the car. Now he's going to prosper. You ain't gonna prosper. You losing. If you didn't know the laws of a car yourself, he wouldn't get your money. So you'll be prospering yourself. You take your money to a dentist because you can't fix your teeth. You take your money to the doctor because you can't fix your body. You take your money to the lawyer because you can't understand the contract. In other words, when a person develops their skill, you take their money to them. It's a law. So why would the NFL call me? They saw a skill. And believe me, your skill is developed for a long time without pay. Just keep working on it. Just keep working. Sometimes you got to work with the children first, you know. Some of you want to be big right away. No, go work in children's church first. Just work on it. I learned to teach by talking to kids who didn't know when I messed up. Let me say it again. You want to be a public speaker? Go teach in children's church. The kids don't know when you don't do right. Go work in the nursery. Talk to them babies. Tell them about God. They don't know if you're messing up. Practice your gift at every opportunity. Stop looking for a check. Look for an opportunity. Work your gift. Work your gift. So he says, if the ax is dull, the edge is unsharpened, you got to work hard and get nothing done. 
but with laws, skill makes it successful. Let me give you this last one before we go. Write this down, please. Luke, Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, and these things will be what? Given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Luke 4, 42, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. I'm setting up for something here. He tell us, he's giving us this kingdom, this country. Now, here's what's unique about it. Matthew, he says, the knowledge of the secrets of this kingdom has been given to you. Knowledge of what? Of the secrets. Write, that, write the word secrets down. He says, there are some secret laws that you're supposed to learn when you come into this kingdom lifestyle. He says, it's not given to those outside. Which means that somebody could be right next to you, losing their job, losing their business, losing all their life, and you right next to them, you gaining all kind of prosperity, gaining your life, gaining your business. Now, walk, how come yours working and mine ain't working? The difference is there's some secrets. He call them secrets. Another verse that makes me interesting, he says, I will give you the keys, plural, of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you unlock on earth will be unlocked in heaven. Whatever you lock up will be locked up in heaven. You got some keys? Loan me your keys. Anyone got some keys handy? All right. This guy just gave me a bunch of keys. Don't forget, okay? What am I going to show you? I got a bunch of keys. I can walk around all day saying, I got some keys. I got some keys. The trouble is, I don't know what they're for. Keys have secrets. I will give you the secrets. I'm going to give you the keys, plural, of the kingdom. Keys are laws. This is a law to a certain place. Suppose this key is to a safety deposit box with $2 million in it. But I don't know that. I got some keys. I broke, you know, I got some keys, side of the road. I got some keys, under the bridge. I got some keys, $2 million. And I'm sleeping on a piece of cardboard with keys. Hold your Bible up. Say, I got some keys. That's a bunch of keys you got in your hand right now. The book is full of the keys. But you're under the bridge. That's why we're going to talk about it this, this week. You have to learn, what is the secret to the keys? The only person that knows the secret to these keys is the one who owns the keys. <laughs> Check this out. Keys and laws. Write this down. Keys are what? Laws. The word for keys in scripture is the same word as principles. Laws, precepts, schemes. These are principles. Schemes. I have a car and I'm still walking because I don't know which car the key opens. I can be in the sea of cars and still be walking because the key's got a secret. I don't know the laws. Write this down. Laws are universal. That means they work anywhere. Number two, laws are permanent. Gravity is always present in any country. Fire burns in England. It also burns in China, and it burns in Calabash Bay. China and England and fire don't have different fires. It's a law. Heat burns. My point is, if you learn the keys, it doesn't matter where you live. I told you, I don't need to leave the Bahamas to be successful. Success comes looking for you in the Bahamas. If you work the laws, 
Number three, principles and laws work anywhere. That means in a crisis, outside a crisis, under crisis, behind a crisis, it works once you get the laws. Number four, principles and laws are not partial. They don't respect a person. Stop saying, Pastor Miles had a break. I had no break. I grew up with roaches and rats, man. But I learned the laws as a teenager. When you were shooting marble, I was reading the Bible. That's all. We use that time differently. You been smoking dope, I been smoking the word. You high, I hire. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. How do you lose? How do you use your time? Don't get jealous of a guy who learned the keys early. That's why I'm here standing here to teach you the keys. You got to learn the keys so you can turn your life around and make your way prosperous. Stop waiting for the economy to turn around. We got to learn in this week how to turn the economy around in your own life. Ain't no lack of money in the world. Ain't nothing went to the moon. Not a dollar left this planet. Everything is still here. But they, the wealth follows laws. It doesn't follow wishes. Money coming. Money ain't coming it. You, you, you got to play, you got to work some laws. Laws are not partial. God don't like Chinese people or white people or yellow people or black people or you red. God, it ain't partial. Gravity will kill anybody. Am I right? Amen. Fire will burn any color skin. Laws are not partial. Number five, principles and laws guarantee success or result. They guarantee them, which means that you can actually control what happens from here on out. I'm going to show you that on Wednesday night. I'm going to give you a key that you'll never forget. You're going to come out of this situation. We ain't going to wait for no government policy. We got our own government policy. Our government policies never change. They work every time. Number six, principles and laws can never be broken. You cannot break guarantee, uh, uh, gravity rather. You can't say, gravity, I'm going to jump in the 10-story building. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. You will not work. <laughs> Gravity say, thank you very much. I'll kill you while you're rebuking me. You don't break laws and expect success. That's the point I'm making. You don't break laws. They break you. Let me tell you something, friends. What makes a good counselor is someone who knows laws. All this psychology stuff you're getting into, listen. The psychologist being divorced four times. You get an advisement for marriage? I did some Freudian studies when I was in university, you know, for Freudian theories, all this deep stuff. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. Yeah, but now what about the laws, the natural laws of God? Laws. You, you, you don't break laws and win. But Pastor Miles, I still don't do this. No problem. I'm going to see you on the other side of your problem. This is just how I feel. Okay. If I let a law. Is it, is it, see, Laws don't take nothing personal. So if I give you advice, it ain't going to be what I think, you know. I always go into law. I can say, okay, this is the law. This is the law of God. I, I never give personal counsel. You come to me for help, I give you laws. Car on the gas, gasoline. You need no prayer, no fasting, no tongues. Go to the gas station. Simple. We ain't got to get spiritual on this, whatever. I give you a law. Law say you need gasoline, go to gasoline. Some people so spooky. And some of y'all be probably, yeah, you trust the Lord. Don't mean that say the Lord. The poison violated the law. You tell them to correct it. Yes. Let me say one more thing to while I'm at it. Here's a key. If I go to a door and try to open the door with this key, and I start speaking in tongues and praying in tongues and reading the Bible and quoting Dr. Monroe's books and, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. The door's still locked, eh? Then I get reading, ah, yeah, my heart, oh, yeah, hey, oh, I repent, oh, yeah, 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 ye
Whatever that emotion you get, door still locked. God don't answer prayer because you pray loud, scream, speak in tongues, or roll on the floor. You got to come with keys. Your emotions don't bless you. You have emotions after the blessing come. Hey, I got it. That's why you don't, 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 you don't stand by the door saying, open. The door say, no. <laughs> I need a key. And the right key too. Don't just come with any key. It's a law. You can't use you know, the wrong law to try to get something right. Hmm? You know, I can marry him even though he ain't a Christian. And I can get him saved. All right. But just don't come to me for advice. I love him. Yeah, you love him. <laughs> you love the locked door too. I love this door. The door says you still need the right key. Laws. Look at number seven. Principles and laws have inherent judgment. Remember I told you that success is predictable, but I also said failure is predictable also? Yeah. If you stay on the roof, you don't got to worry about gravity. Chop off the roof, gravity does its job. Now, if you jump from a four-story building, did God kill you? Did the devil kill you? Who killed you? A law killed you. The judgment is built in to the law. So when you violate a law, failure is not a gift of the devil nor of God. It's a result of violation. So you can't blame anyone for your failure in life. And the only way to correct failure is to go back and retract yourself. And say, let me get back and obey laws. A lady came to me. She was a Seventh-day Adventist. You know, she was telling me one day, she said, y'all don't worship on the right day. I said, okay. I said, well, you know, praise the Lord. And she was working with me in the ministry of education. She was real adamant. And every day she'd come to me, you know, you are. You're going to hell. I said, all right. Y'all worship on Sundays. Okay. But the wake on Saturday, all right. Two months later, she came to me. Can I see you? I said, sure. She sat down. She started crying. I said, what happened? She said, I'm pregnant, and I ain't married. So I asked her, what were you doing on the Sabbath? <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> you know, people are amazing. Trying to keep a law breaking another one and expect to succeed? So she said, she said, what am I going to do? I haven't told my parents yet. I don't know. My whole life is destroyed. Young girl, nice, beautiful girl. I said, oh, well. I said, tell you one thing. Uh, you know, we got to deal with your parents. I'll be happy to meet with them and talk to them for you and we can get this sorted out with them. Uh, she said, you know, uh, I don't know what to do with the baby. I said, well, you can't kill the baby. You know, that's... The baby's innocent. The baby didn't do anything. That baby is pure. You're the one that messed up. And I said, uh, what you are experiencing is the harvest. <laughs> Anybody get my point? Laws got it built in. Have sex, we'll have baby. She said, can you pray for it to go away? I said, no. <laughs> Whatsoever, man, sow it. Some of you are reaping right now stuff you wish you didn't plant. That's the way life is. You don't break laws, they break you. You don't violate them, they violate you. The, the judgment, God doesn't even judge you. The law judges you. It's built into the law. If you want to be successful in your life and to prosper in your life, you got to obey some laws. You don't obey those laws, you're going to struggle all your life. We got to get it right. Number eight, principles and laws protect the product. 
That's why God gave us laws, to protect us. They protect the product. Give you a verse. God says, you may say to yourself, when you become wealthy and prosperous, the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. He said, be careful. But remember the Lord because it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth and so fulfill and confirm his covenant that he made with your father even to this day. He says, look, there are some laws that connected that I activated in your life that gave you the ability to produce wealth. This ain't no lottery. This ain't just happening because you're lucky. It is I who gave you the ability to produce wealth. I gave you the skills, the laws to produce wealth. Closing. Your goal, therefore, in life is not to be employed, but to be deployed. And that's the secret to our coming out of a crisis. It's not employment. It's deployment. In other words, employment prepares you for deployment. Deployment activates your gifts. It energizes your life. It's the juice that makes you get up in the morning. When a person deploys themselves, they don't wait for instructions. They find something that is so sweet to do that they initiate their own activity. Deployment. Deployment is the use and the serving of your natural gift to the world. And everyone came with one or two. In other words, the future of your life is not in a job. It's in your seed, your gift. Lord spoke to my heart. He said, I'm going to give everybody clear instructions this week of what to do for the next 10 months. You're coming out of this. You're going to come out of this. You're going to create your own environment, create your own resources. You're going to create your own revenue. There has to be a change of thinking. Stop being a victim of the news. Don't listen to the news anymore. You are not in that system. You're not controlled by that system. You go to your job, don't depend on it. Begin to ignite your gift. Inside of you is the wealthiest place in the world. It's that seed, unreleased, ungerminated. You've been stuck. It's just like you just go from, from your job to your house to your TV to your bed. There's got to be something else. And the problem is you don't own your life until after five. You got to get to the point where your gift becomes more important than your job. Go to your job, don't get me wrong, but don't trust it. Work on your gift. Work on your gift. The first thing God told man, work. 
Genesis 2.15. First command, work. What did I say? Work. The first command God gave man was work. Not marriage. Work. Not woman. Work. Work. Not a job. Work. <laughs> the word work is the word ergon. It means to become. 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 What in the world is God talking about? God put the man in the garden and says, become. What's he talking about? Well, it's like a seed with a tree trapped inside. Become. It's like a bird with flight trapped inside. Become! God calls that work. Books on potential. Two books I wrote. Five chapters just on work. Go read them. The secret to my life is become! Become! Work means not to do something. Become yourself. First command, become yourself. The last thing they encourage a Bahamian to do in my country is to become. They say, find a job. Get an education, they say, so you can get a job. So you can pay bills and then die. They never say, discover who you are and become it. That's why it's so tough for you, Terry. It's tough for you because you decided, I want to become. And they got no room for you. Your products don't make no sense to them. They want you to work for somebody else. Work. Become. God will never demand what doesn't exist already. Become. There's something in you that you're supposed to become. This word, work, it's like a seed becoming a tree. It's like a, it's like a bird flying. Now I want to just caution you on this last part because I think it's very important. Uh, not all jobs are your work. That's why you hate Monday mornings. Because you go into a place that doesn't allow you to become. You're stuck. You go to, it's like a bird in a cage. You know, a cage allows the bird to fly, you know. But only to a certain limit. They control you. They cage you. You're still a bird. And you can still fly a million miles, but you're in a cage. Your ability hasn't left. Your restrictions hold you back. And they say, this is as far as you go. Every Monday, every Tuesday, every Wednesday, every Thursday, Friday, this is as far as you go. And we have you in the cage until 5 p.m. And we let you out. That's why you dash home in a car. You feel so free, you call it off. You should call it out. Say, out. In fact, I'm telling them, I get an out. <laughs> You ain't getting off. You out of the cage. What do you do? Go straight to the couch. Turn the TV on 
and do something dumb. You watch TV. It ends this week. No more TV. You gotta activate that gift. You're gonna tap into that hidden gift, that treasure. Not all jobs is your work. Write this one down. Your job is never your work. Your job is what they pay you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. They're different. Your job gives you a salary. Your work gives you fulfillment. <laughs> your job gives you pay. Your work gives you prosperity. I met Bill Gates one time. I tell you, I'll never forget that day. Tacoma, Washington. What a day that was. I met a man who used to work for IBM. He used to work for IBM. Did you know that? He used to work for IBM, Bill Gates. He worked in the programming department. He used to write the program, you know, DOS this and DOS that. He used to write them for you all. And one day, he decided, I can simplify this. So he went home in his own house and worked out a formula to create these icons to make it not hard but soft. And he said, we'll put all the hard work behind the scene and just have a desktop and just click on icons. And the work is done behind. Instead of putting in the DOS this, DOS, DOS that, we just do it for you behind. We just let you click. He took it to the board of IBM and he says, I got an idea. They presented him to the people. He stood there before the board. He showed them everything. He said, this will work. The board says, impossible. Bill Gates. They said, it'll never work. But give it to us. We'll keep it. He said, no, 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 no. I don't want you to keep this. If you don't want it, I take it. And he resigned from IBM and went home to his garage and built the first software in his garage. IBM is still trying to recover. They could have owned Microsoft, but they didn't allow a man out of his cage. So he left the cage. And now every IBM computer has his software. I got a feeling some of you are going to come out of the cage in the next few weeks. God's going to give you something that no one's going to have. It's going to be birthed right here in your environment. And they won't believe you the first time. Hold on to your dream. Your work can become your job. What you want to do is go to a place where you actually work. You go to a place where you become. That's the goal. Some of you are in that place already. You go to a place where you actually use your gift. That's wonderful. That's great. You don't got to leave there. At least not now. Stay there. Develop your gift. But not all jobs are your work. But you can find your work in your job. Your work can be in your job. Some people have found it. As you leave here today, please be back here for session two. I'm going to give you the four principles of how to come out of your job, get into your work. And you don't got to depend on the systems no more. 
I found mine. I'm not a victim. We cannot be victims of the system. Be in the world, but not of the world. Be in the system, he says, but don't allow the system to make you a caged bird. As you go out of here today, ask God to show you your job and your work and to see the difference. Are you glad you came out today? Something good is going to happen to you. Something good is going to happen to you. Hallelujah. Our review, very important. I mentioned to you that everyone wants to succeed. Nobody wants to fail in life. And I also emphasize that success is predictable. But I also reminded you that so is failure. You can predict failure and success, and there's a reason why. The reason why you can do that is because of number four. Everything in life was designed and created to function by laws. And therefore, laws make life predictable. Laws make life simple. That means that God designed everything in life to function by laws. Therefore, he designed it to be successful. I also reminded you that your success is good for who? It's good for God. And why is your success good for God? Because of a principle that you need to learn about manufacturing. And that is the success of a product protects the reputation of the manufacturer. So whenever a product fails, that affects the reputation or the name of the manufacturer. Therefore, success is not something you pursue. Success is a result of obedience to those laws. Now, these are very powerful, important principles to remember. Success is not something you try to achieve. This is why most people are not successful. Successful people in history never tried to be successful. They simply focused on pursuing a purpose and then obeying some laws. Now that leads me then to the question again, what is success? Success is not what you've done compared to what others have done. Success is what you've done compared to what you knew you could have done or you should have done. So success has more to do with fulfilling your assignment and your purpose than it has to do with beating someone else in a race. So it's important for you to understand that success is very, very personal, nothing to do with other people. So success in life is discovering two things, your purpose and your assignment. We're going to talk about how that works tonight. Success, therefore, is fulfillment and completion of your purpose. Purpose is the reason why a thing was created. A trumpet is successful when it blows a note. So a trumpet on display in your home on the table is not successful. It's beautiful, it's a nice place to put it, but it's a failure. Why? Because the purpose for a trumpet is to blow a note, not for display. A piano in your home for 40 years, unplayed, has made that piano unsuccessful. Even though it's beautiful and it makes your home look distinguished, that piano is a failure because it was not created for a furniture piece. It was created to do what? Produce music. So purpose determines success. So dressing up nice and wearing expensive clothes is simply a well-dressed failure. If you didn't do what you were born to do and you dressed up, you are a well-dressed disgrace to the manufacturer. So life is not about how you dress or how expensive your shoe is. What's important to life is, are you doing what you were born to do? And this is why most people are failing in life. They have not captured yet what they were born to do. Now in Matthew chapter 13, this is our theme we focused on, Jesus talked about when you live in a kingdom, your success is related to some keys and he calls them secrets. And he said, the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of God has been given to you. 
Those secrets are called keys. In Matthew 16, verse 19, we referred to this in our last segment. I want to read it again. He says, I will give you what? The keys, plural, of the kingdom. There's no key to the kingdom. There are keys, many of them, of the kingdom. Why is this so important? He says, because these keys open up heaven or close heaven. They open up life or close life. In other words, keys are determining whether you live a lock-up life or an open life. Whether you succeed or fail. Now, what are keys? Keys are laws, principles or precepts. They are systems that you use. When you go to a locked door with a key, you are taking a law that makes the door submit and it opens the door. That's what Christ meant when he used the word keys. Keys are systems or laws by which everything functions. Now, I want to give you then an important concept of keys that we dealt with in the last segment. And it's important to repeat it. Keys are principles or laws. Here are some things about principles and laws that you need to remember. Number one, principles and laws are universal. That is important because that means... You don't need to change your country to be successful. A lot of people think if I can just make it to a certain country, I'll make it in life. I have gone to countries where people have left their homes, and today they are sweeping the streets in that country. And they have a lower job in that country than they had in their former country. And some of those people are having to go back to their countries because they thought that that uh, you know the, the country determined their success some of you think if you were to leave the Bahamas and go to America you'll make it believe me it's not a matter of where you are located the issue is do you know the laws of success secondly principles and laws are permanent that means they are the same for Moses as they are for you today laws do not change number three principles and laws work everywhere and anywhere again that's important they work in the midst of a crisis or they work where there is no crisis they work anywhere anytime number four principles and laws are not partial that means laws don't work for certain race of people and then don't work for some other race of people laws work for all people Laws don't work for fat people or skinny people or cute people or white people or black people. Laws work for people if the people work the laws. Number five, principles and laws guarantee success. The only way that you can guarantee something if you follow its instructions. And this is why, again, success is predictable. You can guarantee results if you follow the laws. If you are failing in your life, Try and study what laws you are violating. If you are succeeding in life, study the laws you are obeying. There's no mystery to life. And most of us are hoping to succeed in life and don't understand the laws that are established by God to succeed. Principle number six. Principles and laws never can be broken. Why? You cannot break a law. The law breaks you. Don't think you can violate a law and still be successful. It's like running a red light hoping you won't get an accident. You know, you break laws, then they break you. So if you want to be successful, don't try to take shortcuts. Don't try to find your way of doing things. There are laws established in life by the creator that everyone have to follow. And anyone who follows those laws have the same results. Let me point number seven. Principles and laws are inherent and their judgment is inherent. That means that you don't need to be punished if you violate a law. The punishment is in the law. If you put your hand in fire, no one has to burn you. You violate a law, you get burned. And so it is with everything in life. God doesn't really judge us. The laws he built into life judges us. You have sex. Well, you get pregnant. Who do you blame? Well, you violate a law of fidelity 
or the law of self-control and now the judgment is built in you have conceived a child and now you want to create another law of violating that baby by committing adultery and now you kick in a judgment of guilt for the rest of your life because that child might have been like Miles Monroe so now you sit around with this guilt because you violated law after law after law the way you fix that is you decide I'll never break another law again that leads to point number eight principles and laws protect the product when you obey the laws laid down by the manufacturer you don't need to worry about protection they protect you do not fornicate well you can never be pregnant if you don't fornicate it protects you you don't got to wonder whether I wonder if I'm pregnant I wonder if I'm pregnant well if you had sex you better wonder all night but if you never have sex you can't be pregnant so the protection counts in obedience to the law when you stop at a red light you don't need to worry about getting arrested the protection is in the law so guilt comes when you break a law because you're no longer protected by that law so it is in life with success now that takes me to my point here dealing with God's economic plan I want to just read this verse again because we're going to zero in on these four principles of God's plan for your prosperity now people want to know does God want you to be successful and prosperous let's read Deuteronomy 8 verse 17 you may say to yourself God says my power and the strength of my hand has produced this wealth for me but you must remember the Lord your God it is he who gave you the ability to produce wealth to confirm his covenant that he made to your fathers God is not against you becoming wealthy but he wants you to remember where it came from secondly this verse tells us how to become wealthy and wealth in this verse doesn't come from God in the sense that God gives you money read it carefully what does God give you the ability to produce write that down Wealth comes from finding your ability to produce something the word ability here actually means ideas we're gonna talk about that in a minute now how do you get to work out or produce produce means to actually work something out or to express something the first command that God gave man was to work uh, work shows up in the Bible before a woman and that's because a man needs work before a woman the word work is what I call the law of work everybody's a law of work now remember we're talking about laws work is a law that means anything that stops you from working violates a law so if you want to get something without effort you're violating a law if you want something free you are violating a law that's why God doesn't like beggars a beggar is somebody who wants something without effort let me quote the King David says I have never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg for bread notice the condition righteous what is righteous staying in line with the laws he said if you stay in line with the laws you will never be a beggar why a beggar is not a worker and the first law God gave man was to work matter of fact let's read it Genesis 2 15 and the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden and he commanded the man to what to work and to care for it first command of God work everybody say work say it loud work is not a curse the curse occurs in chapter 3 the curse is not work work shows up in chapter 2 of Genesis no devil no sin no demon and God says work why because work is the reason why you were created let me explain what I mean the word work is the word Aragon in, in, in Greek and Hebrew uh, the transliteration of the word Aragon and the word actually means to become the word work also means to work out something to become what you are I tried to explain this in the last session for example uh, it's like talking to a seed to become what's in a seed a forest trees so when you tell the tree work you're telling the tree become what you already are that's the word for work 
So when God told Adam, work, he was telling Adam, become what's trapped on the inside. So work is not something that the government provides. And that's why you're broke. You're looking for jobs. You're waiting for some investor to come and give you a job. If the investor doesn't come, you can't find a job, you can't pay your bills, you kicked out of your home, and you can't work. Ladies and gentlemen, this is why it's so important for you to remember that work has nothing to do with your understanding. Let me just get rid of this for a second. Work has nothing to do with your finding a job. Work has to do with finding who you're supposed to become. Is that clear? That's the word for work. I am successful because I'm not doing something. I am becoming something. Write this down, please. Very important. Work is like a seed becoming a tree. It's like a, it's like a bird flying. A bird was designed to fly. That's his work. So when a bird is flying, you can actually say the bird is working. When a tree comes out of a seed, you can say the seed is working. When a fish is swimming, you can say the fish is working. Why? It's becoming what it is. Therefore, work is like a seed becoming a tree. Now, let me just say this quickly. Not all jobs are your work. Most people go to a place where they can't become. Why? Because you are restricted by what the job tells you to do and what you cannot do. And this is why most people hate their jobs. Because their jobs actually suffocate their real gift. And so they find themselves hating Monday mornings, going to a place they don't like, and they can't wait to leave it because it's like a bird trapped in a cage for eight hours. Why? Because you are not really working. You have a job. Your job, therefore, will never be your work because it traps you. Your work can become your job if you find your work in your job. In other words, if you have a job where you are becoming, then you are not on a job. You're going to work. It's like a singer who was born to sing and he has a singing business, a job. Well, he's not going to work. He's not going to a job, rather. He's going to work every day. Let me, let me say something very interesting. Jesus said all the time, I work the work of him that sent me. And then he says, I do the work of him who sent me. And then he says, my father works, therefore I work, and I came to work the work that the father gave me to do. He never says job. Jesus had a job, you know. His job was a carpenter. His work was redeemer. He said, I didn't come to be a carpenter. I came really to redeem the world. That's my work. And my work is to do what? The will of my father. That's an important statement. My work is to do what? The will. What is will? The original intent of the manufacturer who sent me. So work is becoming what you were born to be. And work, therefore, can become your job if you are doing in your job what you were born to do. Is that clear? And this is, by the way, this is why most jobs kill people. Jobs can kill you because you can actually be trapped in a place for 40 years, suffocating your life and living in bitterness and hatred and anger, and you are always irritated because you are in a place you don't want to be and don't like to be, and therefore you hate everybody every day for 40 years. And the Bible says what? Bitterness dries up the bones. That means it creates cancer. You ever hear people say, this job is killing me? They are correct. So I've come to you in this session to tell you how to be free from your job so you can find your work because your prosperity is not in your job. Your prosperity is in your work. And just explain how that works now. Okay, write this down please. Your goal in life is not to be employed. Say that with me. My goal in life is not to be employed. Say it again. Can you write that down, please? I want you to write it down. Look at it for a second. 
the number one promise of your governments is jobs so your goal is to get a job the young man here tonight comes out of high school first thing he's told go get a job they never say go get a business the guy who just comes out of college this lady with a PhD or a master's degree comes back home first attempt gotta find a job it's as if we believe we were born to be employed but I want to change your thinking tonight write a new word down you were born to be deployed everybody say deployed say it again deployed employment means somebody else controls you deployment means you release what's on the inside of you those who deploy themselves employ others <laughs> deployers employ if you're tired of being employed focus on being a deployer I'm going to explain what a deploy is in a minute. But that's where your wealth is. Those who deploy themselves determine their own value. Those who are employed, their value is determined by the one who employed them. <laughs> so a salary is really someone else's opinion of how much you are worth. When you deploy yourself, you establish your own worth. So a job is employment. Work is deployment. Employment prepares you for deployment. When you go to a job, always remember this is temporary. I am going to use this opportunity to deploy myself. In other words, deployment activates your gifts and energizes your life, not employment. People who are employed are always complaining. Don't look now, you're sitting next to one. You know, this whole stupid job, I'm tired of being here. These folks don't trust me. They don't know what I'm worth. They don't understand me. I, well, I, I hate this place. They, they're not, I suppose, be a race. How come I'm getting no race? I, I ain't getting promoted. I mean, they spend years just employed and, and complaining while they are employed. And, and the complaint is coming from the fact that their gift is not being activated. Therefore, there's no excitement and no energy in their lives. When you go to a place where your juices come out, where you can release all the desires and the gifts on the inside, you can't wait to get there. As a matter of fact, five o'clock becomes depressing when you are in your work. You don't want to leave it. You know, birds don't get tired flying. Did you know that scientists have discovered that birds get energy from flight and that fish get energy from swimming? That means if what you are doing are wearing you out then that's a sign that you are not in your work a person who is in their gift hates sunsets why they want the day to be longer because they can't wait to stay in what they're doing but if you can't wait for five o'clock you watch your clock from three o'clock till five is it, is it, yeah, that means you are not in your work yet you are on a job you are employed and not deployed write this down deployment is the use and the serving of your natural gift to the world deployment is the use and the serving of your natural gift to the world they asked Michael Jackson one time uh, why do you love singing so much he said because singing is me it is me and that's true remember work is what you want it's becoming what you are so he, he, he called it going to work. Singing is not a job to a real singer. <laughs> so when you find your gift, when you find your, your, your deployment, you actually find the gift you serve to the world. And the world will pay you for being yourself. <laughs> Can you imagine getting paid for something you like to do? That's why people who 
live long are usually those who have found something that they can't wait to do in the morning. Because it's good for your health. It, it gives you actually your adrenaline begins to get higher and your, your systems of throwing against uh, disease is so high because your immune system actually finds strength from a good attitude. It protects you from getting sick. Remember, jobs do kill. Make a note of this. Your future is in your seed gift. It's not in your job. It's in the gift that you have. So let me put this this way then. I'm going to now talk about then the difference between your work and your job. Very quickly, please make notes here. First of all, think beyond your job. Say that with me. Think beyond your job. Say it loud. Think beyond your job. Tell your neighbor right in their face. Think beyond your job. Listen, most people are depressed when they get fired because they did not think beyond their jobs. There's life after your job. There's life after retirement. And believe me, nothing is more dangerous today than retiring. Because, you know, when your great-grandfather used to retire, you know, you, you retired at 65 and you're dead at 70. Today, because of the increase in medical science, you can live to be 80 to 85 average. If you retire at 60, how many years you got left? 25 years more and you are retired. What are you going to do for another quarter of your life? Therefore, you cannot put your hope in a job. And let me tell you something right away. The company you work for, the minute you hit 65, they already start singing the hymns. <laughs> Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Why? You're 65. They already see the young guy come out of college who want to actually work for less. You with me? The older you are, the more expensive you are to the company. So wake up and think beyond your job. That means that the solution to your future success is not in the job you have, it's in which you're thinking beyond the job. And that's why I'm here in this session. Make a note of this. There's no future in any job. I guess those who got fired proved that, right? You got laid off. Or, the, or they only got you on two days work. You realize your future is being attacked by the fact that they laid you off. So you got to cut back on your standard of living. Maybe even lose a car and lose a house. Why? Because your future, you put in your job. No job has a future in it. Make a note of this please. The future is in the one who holds the job. Don't ever allow an organization to be your hope. Every job is temporary. No matter how much they praise you and love you, <laughs> you better think beyond that position. Because when this thing is all over, they will tell you bye-bye. There are folks in this room who have been retired for five years already, and they begin to scratch their heads. Why did I retire? Because life goes on. I'm glad you're here. And young people, please remember what I'm saying because you got a chance to not make mistakes that older people have made. Write this down, please. Create your business in your job. Now, I'm going to explain this in a minute, how this works, because you must make yourself indispensable by refining the value you are to that job. Now, you can't really depend on a job, but you can actually make yourself so valuable that you're the last one they want to let go. And how do you make yourself valuable to a job? You become indispensable. How? By refining your gift on the job. In other words, you make yourself so important to the company by investing in your own gift that they don't want you to go. You know, every job I've ever had, if I can remember far back as I can, they always wanted me to stay. The last one I resigned from was from the government. I used to work for the Ministry of Education. Then I was moved down to public, public personnel. And I worked with the Deputy Prime Minister years ago, uh, the late Sir Clement Maynard. And I resigned five times. Why? They kept refusing my resignation. Why? They said, we don't want you to leave the system because you work effectively, they said. You remember Daniel? You should read the book of Daniel sometime. Daniel made himself so valuable, the king said he was an excellent 
excellent worker and no one wanted to get rid of Daniel. There are some people who can't wait till you leave. Why? You're not an asset. You are a deficit to the company. There are supervisors praying for you to resign. Why? You are not a, a, a help to the company. You, don't, you made yourself a problem rather than a solution. When there's a downsizing taking place in an economy like this, the first person to let go is the one who caused all the problems. That's probably why some people are fired because you, you, you think it was... No, they, were, they, are, they are happy for the crisis. Why? Finally can get rid of you legally and give a reason for it. Yeah, because you made yourself a nuisance. But if you make yourself indispensable by serving your gift with quality and becoming more and more valuable by solving problems for people, they won't let you go. As a matter of fact, I'm going to show you before we end this session that the key to becoming prosperous is solving problems. You are kept for the problems you solved. You are let go for the problems you create. People ask me all the time, how are you doing? My answer is, I'm a solution, not a problem. And I mean that. I said to myself all the time, I solve problems. That's why I'm valuable. I'm valuable because I'm solving your problems tonight. If you want to become the same way, you got to be able to find problems that you can solve and then solve them. Don't look for a job. Look for a problem. People looking for money. Don't look for money. Look for a problem. You solve problems, you get paid. So that's different between your job and your work. Let me give you the differences real quick. Never confuse your job with your work. Why? Your job is what they train you to do. Your work is what you were born to do. Your job is your career. Your work is your life assignment. Your job is your skill. Your work is your gift. You know why they let people go during the crisis? Because your skill come a dime a dozen. They could fire you because they don't need your skill, but they can never fire your gift. It goes with you. A person who knows their gift can never get fired. <laughs> This is why you have to study what is my gift. Now, our problem is our cultures have not trained us to find a gift. They train us to find a job. So they tell you, go get a skill. Remember those words? The problem is your skill is dispensable. Who told you I can need your skill all along? Plus, if I been using your skill for 20 years and now you are making $20,000 a year and a young guy came out of college with a more refined skill in your area he only wants 25 you're gone in other words skills are dispensable but gifts can never be taken away write this down please your work you can retire from your job but you can't retire from your work I've never seen a fish who says I tired swimming I retire. I don't, I don't swim no more. I've never seen a bird that says, I, I retire from flying. I've never seen a seed that says, I retire from bringing forth a tree. In other words, you never retire from your gift. You can retire from your work, from your job rather, from your skill. And many people in this room are actually suffering right now because they retired from their skill. You are you as a secretary, no one wants you anymore. You're a skillful secretary, but they don't want secretaries. So your skill has become your curse. 20 years of experience as a secretary. I mean, you know everything about clerical stuff. The people don't want your skill. So you better find something else, which is your gift. Make a note of this, please. Jobs prepare you for your work. Say it loud. Jobs prepare you for your work. While you are on a job, learn as much as you can, because my Justification for a job is simple. Jobs are opportunities where you are paid to learn. Can I say it again? Jobs are gifts that God gave you to be paid to learn. Don't always try to get a job you really want. Get the one that's available. And don't always think you want a job 
that will only suit what you really like to do. Get a job that's available. Why? Let them pay you to learn some new skills, some new experiences, to meet some new people. How many people have helped me who I used to work with years ago, and that relationship still lasts, and now they are managers of a bank. And we used to work in a warehouse together. So now that relationship has actually opened doors for me to get a loan because I worked at that warehouse. My friend is the manager. See, sometimes your job is not to give you money, it's to give you relationships. So not always go for a job because of money. Most folks don't have a job today because they're looking for the right money. It ain't money that brings the job importance. What makes the job important is that you can get paid to learn something and to also learn people. Is this clear? All right. Make a note of this, please. The power of work. Jobs are temporary, but work is permanent. You know, the, the work of a fish is swimming. <laughs> swimming in a certain part of the, the pool is his job. If you took the fish out of the pool and put him in a pond, have you taken away his ability to swim? His gift went with him, even though you fired him from the, from the pool. See, when they get rid of you, carry a gift with you. Wherever you land, keep on swimming. Because it wasn't the skill that they took away from you. It was the location for you to be in your gift. No matter where I am for the rest of my life, I can never be poor again. Because I've discovered my gift. I will not allow my country or my culture to determine my value anymore in my life. No one will ever determine how much I'm worth anymore. And you've got to get to the point where you are free from the spirit of jobs. And you ignite the spirit of work. And use every job to refine your work. Make a note of this please. You can never retire from your job. From your, from your work rather. But you can retire from your job. Retirement is not in the Bible. It's a capitalist concept. Retirement is not even biblical. You are never supposed to retire. You're supposed to simply finish your work and leave. I have finished my course. I, I, Paul never retired. Christ said, it is finished. He didn't retire. You leave after you finish something. Some of the most miserable people in the world are retired people. Do you know why? You were never created to stop working. What is work? Becoming. If you stop becoming, you stop existing. No wonder why you're so paranoid and hate everybody. Because you ain't being yourself lately. People who live long are those who have found something that they love to do all their lives. If you can't wait to get rid of your job, it's because it's not your work. Number four, your work protects you from your job. Write that down. If you learn your work, you're not afraid if they take away your job. When they threaten to fire you, you should say, it's okay. Why? You could take away my job, but you can't take away my work. You can take away my skill, but you can't take away my gift. You can take away the activity, you can't take away the ability. Your gift is more important than your skill. And number five, write it down please. Your work is your seed. We're getting into deep stuff now. Everybody say seed. Your work is your seed. What do I mean by that? Let's talk about this for a minute. The most important verse in the Bible that I've ever read that set me free from employment is this one. It was read tonight. As a matter of fact, uh, I was showing Pastor Roll my Bible tonight. How many of you have an NIV? Hold it up, please. An NIV Bible. Come on, Freeport, hold it up. Anyone got an NIV? New International Version. Hold it up in there. NIV. Now, I told you all a long time ago to buy the NIV. Some of you all still got the King James. The NIV is probably the best translation I know because the scholars were honest. The work they did in the translation of the Hebrew and the Greek is one of the best in history. Let me read, please turn your Bibles to 11, chapter of Ecclesiastes. Let me show you the difference between the NIV and your Bible. Big difference. NIV says, verse 1 of 11, Ecclesiastes. Verse 1. Ship your grain across the sea. 
what does your King James say? Cast your bread upon. See, completely different. In Hebrew, it means ship your grain across the sea. That means become an exporter. Next verse. After many days, you may receive a return. A return means dividends. You get a return on your investment. This chapter is about business. Not about a loaf of bread. <laughs> ship your grain where? Across the sea. Now, this is completely opposite to what the Bahamas is doing. We're not shipping grain across the sea. We are importing the grain. So someone else is getting the return. Hmm. What I have done is exactly what this says. My books and CDs and DVDs and my life is always being shipped across the oceans. So I'm getting the returns on that shipment. In other words, you're not supposed to be a consumer. You're supposed to be a producer. I will give you the ability to produce wealth. The exporter will always be richer than the importer. The Bible says don't put all your eggs in one basket. You got this one job. <laughs> you are a barber, okay? You are a barber. Brother Smith is a barber. Suppose Brother Smith broke his hands. Fell down and broke his two hands. The barbering is gone. So what he should do is actually go beyond barbering. He should now import hair products just in case his hand get broken he can sell products don't put all your eggs in one basket it says you carpenter your hands are important to you break both of your risk it's over so you better learn to import furniture while you're a carpenter and learn how to Get in touch with those who, who, who you buy wood from. Say, I'm going to be a wood supplier just in case my hand broke. I sell wood to the other carpenters. I don't need my hand to sell wood. In other words, seven, invest in seven ventures, it says. But I won't get to that, you know. Let's get down to this verse. By the way, I think I, think I better read this part here. Verse 4. Whoever watches the wind will not plant. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. Those who watch the wind means waiting for luck. That word wind means luck in Hebrew. Those who are waiting for luck. You are smiling. I wonder why you are smiling. He said those who watch the wind will not plant. That means they will not go out and work. They play, play numbers all day. They borrowed a plan. Listen, this ain't funny. He says, this is why we, this is why we poor. He who watches the wind, who watches for luck, will not work, he says. Whoever looks at the clouds will not reap. As you do not know the path of the wind or how the body is formed in the womb, so you cannot understand the works of God, the maker of all things, said therefore, this verse, sow your seed, where? In the morning and in the evening, let not your hands be idle. That's the verse you must remember. Sow your seed when? In the morning. And in the evening, let not your hands be idle. Listen to the Bible. This is the best advice I ever heard in my life. BFM was built after 5 p.m. This place, that's worth millions, was built after 5 p.m. I had a job. Henry had a job. Richard had a job. We used to meet after 5 p.m. and work till 2 a.m. in the morning. Building this. Why? Sow your seed in the morning. That means go to your job in the morning. What's the next verse? Read it. And in the evening, don't turn on the TV and watch two as a company. Or is it Three. Don't watch friends. Don't. In other words, the guys who you're watching already with rich. He said, when you go home, don't watch TV. Keep working. From 
8 a.m. to 5 p.m. is the other man's work. And that's why you're broke. Because from 5 p.m. to 12 midnight, you watching TV, eating potato chips. The Bible says, no, when evening comes, let not your hands be idle. I do more work while you are sleeping than when you are awake. I guarantee it. My wife will tell you the hours I put in after 12 midnight. The books I write, I write while you're sleeping. People say, how do you write books? While you're sleeping. You, the Bible says, you fall in love with sleep, you shall grow poor. The Bible says that. I got to go to bed at 8 o'clock. You will never be wealthy. Because the eight hours from 8 a.m. doesn't belong to you. They tell you when to come, where to do, where to go, what to do, when to go to lunch, when to come back, and they control your entire life. That means the only life you own is after five. You can never grow from eight to five. You grow in your own time. You can't read books on the man's job. You can't experiment with ideas on the man's job. He got you locked down. Remember, you are a bird in a cage. What do you do when you leave work, you call it? He says, you don't know which one will profit you, whether both equally as well. Let me put it this way. Write this down. Jobs were given to prepare you for your work. He said, go to work in the morning. And when you get off, keep working. Work on your gift after 5 p.m. Work on your skill at 8 a.m. Give them your skill at 8 a.m. Release your gift at 5 p.m. That's the key to your success and your, pro your prosperity. Make a note of this. Fulfillment is discovered when your job becomes your work. You can actually work yourself out of your job. That is what we did here at this ministry. And I've done it actually to, so well that I don't get no pay from this ministry anymore. Why? You can work yourself out of your job. Your work can become so powerful you don't need, you don't need your job anymore. But your work doesn't take place on the man's job. What are you doing after five? Your culture says go home and rest. The Bible says, let not your hands be idle. The culture says, go lay off and drink some switcher and watch TV. The, the Bible says, let not your hands be idle. Anyone in this room who's a business person will tell you that <laughs> you don't want to go into business. You think you want to go into business. Business people who don't, don't sleep, they just rest for a few hours. Because they have found something more important than a job. Can I put it this way? Write this down. Success comes after sunset. That's when it really comes. You read all, this, all the books on success, they'll tell you that people who succeed were succeeding while you were sleeping. What do you do? Write a cookbook, man. And I'm going to take days and years and months to do that in the night. But don't just sit there and watch TV. Produce a cookbook. You're a chef, man. Produce a cookbook. That cookbook will be published. You'll be on Chopped. You don't have no idea. You have no idea. You don't, you don't know that. So why waste your time watching TV when you can actually produce something that can be published and go around the world like me? The royalties that pay your life off. You can just have a job or you can get into your work after five. Every one of you, I can tell you right now, each one of you, an idea that you can pay me for. Of what you're doing. What you're doing right now is not what you could do. But you got to pay me to give you the idea. You come to me, I counsel you. I'll give you consultancy. I'll show you what I get paid for. Why? Because what you're doing ain't nothing compared to what you could do. But your culture says, go home and rest. God says, go home and keep working. Success after five. I remind myself again. Let's read together loud. Go. Sow your seed in the morning, and at evening, let not your hands be idle. Why? Because you do not know which will succeed, whether this one or that one or 
both. Can you imagine that? That means you can have a job after the job and both bringing in thousands of dollars. We've been taught, no, get a job, settle down, die, get buried. You know, this is what they told us. And the Bible is saying, no, there's life after five. Hmm. Is this good? I want you to think about this. What do you work on after five? Your gift. Proverbs chapter 19, chapter 18 rather, verse 16 says, A man's gift makes room for him in the world. Not a man's education. You got a PhD and you still broke. Why? Because the PhD doesn't make you wealthy. As a matter of fact, most PhDs are hired for those, by those who dropped out of school. Let me say it again. Most PhDs are working for those who dropped out of school. Because the person who didn't get a PhD got an idea. And they employed a guy with a PhD. It's not your education that brings you before a great man. It's your gift. Bill Gates dropped out of school. You know, his teachers actually thought that he was mentally damaged because he could never pay attention in class. I read his story. Matter of fact, uh, he said the reason why he couldn't pay attention in class is because he was always ahead of the teacher. They thought he had, you know, learning disorder. You know, he had a disorder of learning too much, too fast. The teacher was always behind him. And they actually sent him for psychological analysis. They thought he was crazy. So he quit school. Started Microsoft. Went to IBM, tried to give them some ideas. They said, you're crazy. So now... They use his ideas in their computer, and he gets billions of dollars. Stephen Jobs, what a guy. Quit college, built a, 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 a computer in his garage. Now he employs all the PhDs, even in his death. See, you've been told, get an education, get a job, pay bills, and die. And here I come telling you, no. Find your gift. De de deploy a gift, become wealthy, and live. And bless the world. And employ people and help them. <laughs> your gift. Your gift is more important than your skill. Now here's something I want you to remember. Write this down. You always have what you were born with. You're not born with skills. You have to learn to be a carpenter. <laughs> So there's something more important than being a carpenter. You've got to find your gift. Because your gift will outlast your skill. There can become a day where you can become so feeble you can't handle a hammer. What are you going to do after that? You're still alive. Number two, you can never lose what you were born with. Number three, your future is not ahead of you. It's trapped on the inside of you. Therefore, you were born with seed. You don't go looking for it. So the key to your life is discovering and developing and serving your seed gift to the world. Always look for the other thing in your life. It's there, you know. Just look for it. It's always with you. But no one ever told you this until I come into your life tonight to tell you, don't trust their jobs. The crisis is because you lived on the jobs. The crisis is because you depended on the jobs. The crisis came because you depended on the clients. And they don't come no more. May God have mercy on us. There's hope. Yes, the hope. Seeds are never in recession. Isn't that beautiful? When I went to Haiti for the first time, I saw plants growing. I was shocked. Because the United Nations, based on their statistics, say that Haiti is the poorest country in the world. The only problem is no one told the seeds. <laughs> Got my point? The seeds don't care what's the poorest country in the world. They're going to grow once they get the right environment. That means you ain't supposed to care what they say about the crisis. Once you get the right environment, you're going to bring forth. You're going to grow. 
Seeds are never in recession. Gifts are never in recession. Jobs are in recession. But not work. Hallelujah. There's something that's bigger than you. And it's inside of you. When I was praying for tonight, I was praying that God would ask me. I was asking, I said, God, show me how to get on the inside of the person and yuck it up. Yuck, yeah. How to get inside your spirit and yuck up your gift and let you see it. This is you. You are not what they call you. They give you titles. Don't trust their titles. Find your gift. Your seeds are never in recession. My friends, let me give you these last points before I get to the four principles. Two words. One, employment. What is employment? Bahamians, please write this down. Employment is the opportunity to serve your gift in the context of a corporate group. And usually you benefit other people. Deployment is different. Deployment is the discovery of your gift and serving your gift to your generation. You can be deployed or employed. You can deploy your gift in the context of other people's control or you can deploy your gift to your whole generation and they will bless you. When you begin to see life beyond your career, beyond your skill, you become a generational changer. This is the difference between employment and deployment. And I challenge you tonight to think about where you are in your life, your age, whether you are young or old. Think about where am I in the scheme of this teaching? What's happening to my life? How many more years I could have left? Some of you are, are divorcees. Some of you are widows or widowers. And you, you, your life is at a point where you say, what am I supposed to do next? And God says, I'm going to tell you tonight. Find your gift. Serve it. You and I were created to be employed. God created seeds to bring forth trees. He created birds to fly. He created fish to swim. He created you to bring forth. There's something that made him create you. And that thing is the key to your prosperity. Now I'm going to give you my secret. The secret law of success. How do you become successful? Here's my answer. If you want to be successful, do not seek success. Can you write that down, please? Put it on your mirror where you fix your face. If you want to be successful, do not seek success. So what do you do? You seek to become a person of value. That's the key to your prosperity. You seek to become a person of value. The person who becomes successful and prosperous is the person everybody wants to go to to get something done. <laughs> you know, the safest business in the world is undertaking. Being undertaker. Why? People die in every day. So the guy meets a need. He got you covered. He made himself what? Valuable. Why do you go to the dentist even if you have a recession? Because the dentist made himself valuable. Eight years of study. Why do you go to a doctor and give him your money in the middle of a recession? Because the doctor spent 14 years specializing in something. He made himself valuable. He refined a gift. Why do you take your money to the lawyer? 
because the lawyer spent six years refining the law and so you take your money and give it to the lawyer why the lawyer made himself or herself valuable question here's the question why should I come to you how you answer that question tells me if you're gonna make it <laughs> here's, here's a question more difficult why should I come and bring my money to you what is it that you've refined that make me find you. The secret of success. Becoming valuable. So here's the process of becoming valuable. I'll give you the secret. Number one. To become valuable first. You must de determine what your gift is. Some people may have one or two. Like me, you know, I have three or four gifts. I, that was my problem most of my life until I figured it out. You know, you got to choose one and focus on it. But I got a lot of gifts. I'm a, I'm a musician, naturally. You know, I'm a writer. I'm a public speaker. I am able to actually uh, pr produce music. I can do a lot of stuff. I have to decide which one I'm going to focus on. That's all. Listen, you don't want to be a jack of all trades and master nothing. Write this down. You are paid for what you master. People ain't looking for you who's a general contractor. Some of them wonder why they can't find jobs. You're too general. <laughs> you better find a specific area that you focus on. Where they're going to need you. They come look for you. Don't just be a carpenter. Find a niche. I'm the creator of bookshelves only. And put it out there. You will see business coming to you like crazy. If you say, I'm just a carpenter. Hey, a tile, tile, diamond does it. And they start comparing you to others. But if you only make shelves, bookshelves, they can't compare because not everybody just makes bookshelves, you see. And now you become valuable because you have what? Become a refined gift. That means you become significant. Significance makes you valuable. Significance means you are different from the others everybody sells shoes fine a lady came one time she said pastor miles i want to open a shoe store i say don't she said why i say everybody's selling shoes she said but so what do you advise my, my advice is that i said now this is free only sell baby shoes from zero to five you'll make it today she has one of the largest shoe stores in new jersey people fly from different parts of the state to buy shoes. Why? They ain't got to wonder if their baby shoes in that store. Of course, she ain't pay me nothing. <laughs> in other words, you can't just sell something. Sell one thing that is you. Uniqueness. At least the point number four. Everyone's created to born and born with a unique gift that makes them valuable. That means your success is in your gift of value there's something that you were born with that other people don't have the way you have it hmm? everybody's selling cell phones so why are you going to cell phones you better find a different type of cell phone just to sell that's all in other words uniqueness makes you valuable what did i say okay you cosmetologist you go you, you, you going broke i'm telling you you better find a unique cosmetological, that's a big word, pers perspective where you offer something that others don't offer. You know, one time me, me and my wife went to, my wife went to Monte Carlo. Went to Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo. Man, that's where all the big mucka mucks are. And we went into a store where, you know, one pair of shoes is $5,000. We went in there, the, the rug in the store was white. Thick white rug in the store. You, not, in other words, don't come in here if you get dirty shoes. And... It, 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 this was a, a clothing store. No clothes were seen. All the clothes upstairs had hidden away. And then they ask you, can I help you? And we walk in. They say, come, please have a seat. They sit us down at a beautiful glass table. They serve us tea and cookies. I just come to buy, you know, clothing. 
They said, no, you ain't coming here for no clothing. You're coming here for an experience. What a store that was. By the time they finished whining and dining you, they said, uh, come upstairs and see our wares. Walk up there, everything in these little private little box boots. I tell, my, I tell my wife now, you know, go for the cheapest thing here because this, this, this is a rough place. I saw one dress, it say 28,000. I said, oh yeah. Mm -hmm, honey, come on this side over here. Walk over here, there was a belt. The belt was $400. I said, yeah, that belt must just feed you. And like I saw a purse, $5,500. Just a little purse. I said, take me to the wrong store. <laughs> but we, done, we, we already drained the tea and ate the cookies. We had to buy something. You remember that store, baby? It was a rough store. We had to buy something. My point is, they were unique. That's why people fly all over the world, come to that one store and buy one dress. Now, here you are trying to make $5,000 a month in your store. They make $5,000 on one dress. Because they're not selling dresses. Y'all should pay me for this tonight. You want a restaurant? Okay, you ain't gonna make it. You ain't gonna make it. Everybody, restaurant open today, close tomorrow. You know that, right? Yeah, why? Because they don't understand what I'm teaching. You can buy a sandwich anywhere. People don't buy sandwiches, they buy experiences. Why would you go to a restaurant on Paradise Island and pay $98 for a chicken and buy the same chicken at Dirty's? For how much? Five dollars. Same chicken, you know. Same chicken. Why? You're not buying chicken on Paradise Island. You're buying a unique experience. That's what makes it valuable. They can, you know, you get chicken anywhere, but you can't get the experience where the guy take the napkin, put it on your lap, bam, and then he pour your water for you, and then take it away to make sure you don't pour it by yourself. Understand? And they serve you one course at a time. So it is everything in the bag. Boom, 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 boom. No, 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 no. We separate each chip from each other in this restaurant. See, you eat one chip at a time. You wonder, what am I doing here? You are buying an experience. Here's my question. Why should I come to you? What makes you as a lawyer different? What makes you different as a lawyer? If I come to your lawyer's office, I mean, what, what experience do I have? What, what makes me want to come back? Not, not for law. I get law anywhere. What makes me want to come back to you is the question. Is this good stuff? All right. The test of your gift. All gifts will be tested for authenticity. In other words, when you start releasing your gift, get ready for hell to break loose. Can I say it again? All gifts will be tested. When you decide to become a deployed person, your enemies wake up. So just get ready for the fight. Testing is to prove your commitment and your dedication to your gift. Didn't, you know, that's, that's the way life is. In other words, a tested vision will be trusted. People will trust you for what you survive. So you will never be completely accepted until you're being completely rejected. When you decide to stop being employed and decide to be deployed, all your enemies wake up. So you've got to be ready for the fight and stay focused. That's why it's hard to do what you're doing, son. Because what you're doing, ain't nobody doing. And you wonder why it's so hard. You got to keep, wake after five. Sometimes, sometimes you got to get a job while you're working on it. Why? Because you got to keep working on it. You got to pay your bills, but you got to keep working on it. Because there will be tests. And let me tell you, the good news is the test doesn't come to destroy your gift. It comes to prove your gift. Never trust a person who didn't go through the test. You don't trust a product that hasn't been tested. Your credibility comes from the crisis. So we want people who are not afraid to bring their gift out. You know, when you start working in your house at night after 5 o'clock and your family comes to visit you, girl, what you doing? Boy, what you doing? I'm working on my gift. What you talking about, boy? You better go rest yourself. You wake all day. And they start talking you out of it. That's the way it is in life. Today, my family all support me. They all agreed me. Some of them worked for me. But when I first started, none of them understood me. 
Because when you start deploying yourself, you will be tested. Tell your neighbor, get ready for the test. All right. So how do you then become successful? The four principles are here. It's found in first book of Moses, Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. And I wanted to bring it to this because this is the heart of success. Every company in the world uses this program. It's God's kingdom system. Genesis 128. Now if you read Genesis 126, it tells you what you're supposed to do. The Bible says, and God created man in his own image, his likeness, to have what? Dominion, okay, over the earth. Verse 27 says, so God created them male and female and blessed them and said, have dominion. So that means both male and female, same instructions, have dominion. Now, God is a good God. He knows what he made. He knows why he made it. But he also tells it how to produce it. Remember now, he said he can give you what? The ability to produce the wealth. So verse 28 is God's giving you the strategy to dominate. Oh boy, help me. So God is saying, look, I don't just want to tell you what to do. I'm going to show you how to do it. He says, the Lord blessed them and said unto them. What is God doing? He's talking. Who is he talking to? Humans. What's he saying to them? Instructions. And he's giving them instructions for what? To learn how to dominate in the earth. So you got to follow the instructions. This is not funny. This is the most important instruction in the world. He says, first of all, be fruitful. Secondly, multiply. Third, replenish. Four, subdue. And what's the last line? And then you'll have dominion. You were born to dominate in an area of gifting that people will pay you to do. I repeat, you were born to dominate in an area of life that people are supposed to pay you to do it. I repeat, you are supposed to dominate in an area of life that people are supposed to beat the door down to get to you, to pay you to do it. And here's how it happens. God gave us a secret. Now, I must be honest with you. The people of the world have done this more successfully than the people in the body of Christ. Matter of fact, the world has stolen God's principles and applied them more effectively than the people who claim they got the light. Let me quote, write this down please. Luke chapter 11 verse 16. It says, The children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Therefore, go to the world, I'm quoting Jesus, and learn from them. That you may have riches in this life and the life to come. I am quoting Jesus. Please listen to me. He said, look, go to the world. Why? The children, the children of this world, the children of this world, that means the world system, are wiser, he says, than the children of light. The word wise means to apply. They are applying my principles more effectively than you who showed and speaking in tongues. He says, so don't despise them, don't get mad at them, and don't get jealous of them. Go to them, he says, and learn from them. That's in the Bible. Now, here's the problem. You've been taught by your religious background, stay away from them. Christ comes and says, go keep company with them and learn what they're doing. Why? Because they're applying what I taught you better than you applying it because you don't even know it. And they know it. And that's why they're successful. They're employing you. How come you work for a sinner? Because laws have no respect for whether you're saved or unsaved. <laughs> you keep the law, you get the results. Huh? He says, go to them. They've learned my principles. They have figured it out. They are more successful. Now, Tell me one of them who didn't follow God's plan. And I'm going to give you the plan right now. Number one. He said be fruitful. The word fruitful in Hebrew means to be 
a producer to produce something. Be fruitful doesn't mean to have children. The Hebrew word means to produce. What do you think a fruit is? It's produce. That means what was on the inside of the tree has come out. Be fruitful. He didn't say go looking for fruit. Which means the fruit exists. Be productive. And then he says, now that you produce a fruit, let me use myself as an example. This is my book. I wrote this. This is mine. It says here, USA Today bestseller. That means millions, you know, sold. Okay. I stayed up while you were sleeping and produced this. It took me months and months to produce this. Hard work. I'm doing two books right now. I've been doing them for the last six months. One will be finished in November. The other one will be finished not until April next year. What are you doing? So when I go home after I leave it tonight, I don't go to bed. My wife will tell you, I work. My fruit came out of me, my fruit. Now, here's the problem. This is my fruit. Can this make me wealthy? No. No. Only got one. I got one. So God says, go to the next level. Multiply. So I got to find a way to take the manuscript that I had, which was my fruit, and put it in a stage where it can be multiplied a million times. A manuscript is a fruit. A book is when you multiply it. Now I have thousands of them. But let me ask another question. If I got a thousand books stuck away in my garage, am I still wealthy? No, I still broke. Matter of fact, I owe the publisher plenty of money. So multiplying is not enough. Third level, replenish means to distribute. That means I got to get the books out of my warehouse and get them in the hands of people. Okay, now I got my books out and I sell 3,000. Am I a worldwide author yet? No. Because 3,000 gone, which only 3,000 people get. That's even, you know, less than 10% of our population. So I got to do something else. I got to move to the fourth level. I got to subdue. Subdue means to control the market. Hmm. Control the market means when you start distributing your product, it becomes the most important one in the market. So that when people think of it, they think of you. Let me give an example. What is McDonald's known for? Big Mac. Interesting. Big Mac. They sell all kinds of but Big Mac is their fruit. Can you buy a Big Mac everywhere? No. So they got you cornered. You can't even make it at home. You can buy the bread, the burger, the onions, and you still can't make a Big Mac. Because they have refined it. Remember, refined the gift? There's a system that they have. You can never get a Big Mac in your house. You can never make it. It never tastes like it. Okay, so we got a Big Mac. What's the problem? I'm still poor. So I got to find a way to multiply the Big Mac. So I got to have what we call uh, machines or you know, people to help make the same burger according to the system. You cannot work for McDonald's and make your own burger in the kitchen. They train you how to make their burger. Why? They want consistency of the same quality. Okay, so now we, we multiply. But now we want to what? Distribute. So they create what? Franchises. A franchise is McDonald's distributing its Big Mac. Now, they have become so widely distributed that they have subdued the market on Big Mac. Nobody got a Big Mac. You want a Big Mac? You drive past Burger King. You drive past KFC. You drive past Wendy's. Why? Because no one got a Big Mac. Is anyone driving past anyone to get to you? 
You know, I get all these invitations from all over the world. I say, why are they inviting me on a little island seven miles wide when they got 300 million people in America? Somehow, I develop a Big Mac that they can't find nowhere else. I am here to help you go into your closet and find your Big Mac. Everybody makes burgers, nobody makes a Big Mac. Now we got Burger King, what they got? Whopper. They say, we don't need no Big Mac, we got our Whopper. They will whop you. They're the only ones who can whop you. No one else can whopper anybody except Burger King. Am I right? You want a whopper? You can't even make it in your own house. They got a system. They what? Refined it. It's their fruit. They produced it, and now they multiply it, and now they're distributing it, and they subdue the whopper market. You want a whopper? You drive past everybody. You will leave your home and drive miles if you want a whopper. Why? Because they're the only ones with the whopper. They subdue. They control the market. What do you control yet? I remember I got a call from T.D. Jakes a few years ago. T.D. Jakes says, look, Dr. Monroe, we are in a meeting here in Dallas, and uh, we're discussing a leadership cruise, and, and the first name that came up was yours. Let me tell you why that's important. Christ says, if you want to be great, <laughs> he says, serve your gift to the world. Then he says, if you want to be first, become a slave to your gift. Hmm. Comprende? If you want to be what? First. That means the first one they think of. That's right. What do you do? You can become a slave in the night to your gift. What are you working on all night? You know, just, you know my, my captain here, Thurston. I mean, pilot extraordinaire. I never get rid of this guy. He'd have to leave me. Why? This guy has refined his gift. What do you have that people will run you down to get? What you're hearing tonight, no one in the Bible has ever told you. They just told you, get a job. And you know you can't live the way you're living for the next 40 years to try to feed your kids. Take them through college. What you doing can't pay their college rent. You got to find something. And God is saying, I'm telling you what it is. You got to find your gift. Get your Big Mac. Make yourself valuable. Subdue the market. Apple computers. Announcement two days ago, right? 48 hours ago, they said, My, uh, Apple is the... What is this? The, the most successful enterprise in history. $600 billion profit. And the guy did. What did he do? He made one computer. Apple. What's your Big Mac? I want you to go home and think about what is it that I got a passion for? Once you produce a fruit, God gives you wisdom to multiply it. He will find you distributors and you subdue a part of the market where they got to come to you. You know, uh, in, in a few weeks, I'm going to be calling all the business people together, okay? You all don't mind, right? I want to have just one day with the business people. I'm going to give you some secrets that they pay me for. I can give it to you free. I'm going to show you how to make your business go to the next level. You blow everybody's mind. I'm going to give you a way to become so different that everybody will find you in the middle of a crisis. You have to learn that everybody doing what you're doing. So you can't do it the way they do it. Everybody making burgers. You know why we like dirties? Dirties got a way to fix chicken. Am I talking right? I mean, you try to fix that home. You, you, could, you could buy the paper bag, take it home, you know, put it in. This thing still ain't got the taste. Why? I think they got some old grease in there that, that does something. That, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and they keep that grease for a few days. You, gotta, you, gotta, you need the old grease to get that taste. I don't know, they're doing something, but it's unique. <laughs> what makes you different? The result is what? You have dominion. Dominion means to impact the environment. I went on Google today, sitting in my office with one of our workers. I Googled my name. 
295,000 results. That's on the first page. Wow. Most of them are stores with my product. Amazon, Miles Monroe. Look at the stars next to my name and my books. Four stars, five stars. That means these are top sellers. My, my distribution system. I'm not teaching you something I haven't done. And I'm not different from you. I, I live right around the corner. And I was born in Bain Town. But they never taught me this. That's why I'm teaching you. We've been a victim of this thing that says it's a crisis. Ain't no crisis. It's a crisis of thinking. Go home and find your gift. Some of the wealthiest people in the world are sitting in your chair right now. Tell your neighbor, think. Here we go. God never told us to be seedful. What does that mean? That means that he has already assumed that you got seed. He said to be what? Fruitful. Fruit comes from seed. So God is saying, look, I'm not telling you to go look for seed. You already got it. I want you to produce something. That means that the seed is, is within you already. It has life in itself. And you possess the fruit that you're supposed to prosper from. That means that your seed possessed the fruit. But fruit is never for the tree. I've never seen a tree eat its own fruit. Have you? When you were born with a fruit, it was never for you. It was for us. The problem is we can't find you to get the fruit. And by the way, you never see a tree bringing its fruit to you. When a tree bears its fruit, everyone is attracted to it. You know, dentists don't advertise, you know. Lawyers don't advertise. You know, they don't advertise much. They, they, why? They got their fruit, man. You, you, you'll find them. When you see a mango tree across the fence, laden down with ripe mangoes, all kind of anointing thoughts come into your mind. This fence is in the way. Right? And you will do some things to get to the tree. In other words, the tree simply produces fruit and the clients find the tree i have never invited myself anywhere to speak whether it's a bank or harvard university or any organization any church anywhere never have i ever once invited myself anywhere they came looking for the fruit make me come to you please make me come to you Give me something that I have to come to you for. Is this good? Number six, seeds need the right environment. Uh, I am going to South Africa tomorrow. And when I come back next week, I think I'm going to meet with you one more time. Because you need to understand that you could have a good seed and still be broke. <laughs> you put a mango seed on a tiled window and leave it there for 50 years. The tree is still in the seed. Wrong environment, wrong friends, wrong books, wrong TV shows, wrong people. You, you're in the wrong environment. Dr. Monroe ain't got too many friends, you know. I choose my friends very carefully. I got plenty of people around me, very few friends. Friends to me are fertilizer. You leave here and you go to your house and there's a dream killer in the house. <laughs> they talk you out of your dream. When you get up out talking, but you got vision, you got dream, you got seed. You got to settle down and go get, get a job and, you know, help pay these bills. And then they, when they finish with you, you go right back to your old way of thinking. You need to produce 
the right environment to bring forth the seed. My wife and I went to Egypt. We went to the pyramids. Walked in there. Big, bigger than this room. Underneath the pyramids. And there was a display of King Tut. They had just found this display. And here I am looking at King Tut. 4,000 year old bones and face. I mean, this is the Egyptian king. And in one of those glass cases, there was some seeds. And I asked the guy at the talk, I said, what are these? He said, these are seeds we found in the tomb of King Tut. I said, are you kidding? He said, no, these are 4,000 year old seeds. They were petrified, you know, they were frozen in, in, in the, the, the desert dry heat. I said, are they still good? He said, well, let me tell you a story. He says that uh, we shipped these seeds to Israel and they did tests on the seeds and they germinated the seeds. The seeds produced the largest ears of corn and of, uh, of maize that they ever saw. I said, wait a minute. Are you telling me that four year, 4,000 year old seeds produce? He said, yeah. He said, they were just waiting on the right environment. How old are you? You think you're too old? You think it's it? Is that for you? Did they, did they tell you it's over? What you need is the right environment one more time. Don't ever let no one write you off. Go home, start again. The Bahamas will kill you. Get free from the Bahamian culture. They done wrote you off. You're a drug addict. You're a prostitute. You are divorced. They are lying. All you need is another environment again. That's all. In that seed, 4,000 years, was a plant waiting for the right environment. They never taught you this in school, hey. This should have been the first lecture you got when you went to high school. You wouldn't have been sitting around here worrying about keeping a job. And there wouldn't be a bunch of foreigners owning the Bahamas. What kind of country have we built? A country of dependents who look to a government to provide jobs. Write this down, please. Every problem is a business. You were born to solve a problem. Say it with me. I was born to solve a problem. Just give me five more minutes, okay? Because this is important. This is what your father should have taught you the last 50 years. That's why it takes so long for me to give it to you. I'm trying to save you 50 years of ignorance in one night. You have to remember that you were born to solve a problem. And that's where businesses come from. A business is simply someone solving a problem. Fast food solved the problem. You ain't got time to eat breakfast in the morning for no hour. So on your way, you stop at a window. And by the time you get to work, you had breakfast. Someone solved that problem. You know what I'm missing? Shoe shine boys. I'm missing them. My shoes need cleaning right now. I ain't got no time to clean no shoes. If you stop asking for money, think about a solution. When I saw the first massage chair in an airport, it was an Asian. I said, oh boy, something started here. Now every airport you go in got massage chairs. Why? Because people get tight when they travel. They need to relax. So someone saw a problem. Now that's a billion dollar business. Ten minute massage for ten dollars. Five thousand massages in one day. It's five hundred thousand dollars. Somebody said we can solve this problem. Why don't you go around just look in the Bahamas and look for some problems? Why? God gave you the ability and the gift to solve a problem and therefore whoever solves the problem becomes wealthy. We ain't got no poverty problems. We got blindness problems. We don't look for solutions to problems. We look for problems to complain about. Hmm. <sighs> 
business is all around you why problems are all around you why do people put you know like those things like those kind of raster type look in the hair you know what they say they say because it's easy to fix just shake it and you go to work you know what I'm talking about yeah the natural look I guess it is yeah I asked my daughter I said daughter why not she said she said, I ain't got time to fix my hair in the morning I just shake it and go to work someone solved the problem we put the stuff you know fix it you don't gotta worry about it that's a solution that's not funny that's a solution people don't want to spend an hour in the morning fixing the hair Don't laugh at that. You, what, what are you doing? What are you doing? Study the problems. Spend the whole day tomorrow just driving around looking for problems. You'll be amazed. Businesses everywhere. Matter of fact, listen for complaints. Every complaint is a business. Lord help me all right let me give you eight keys to become successful in business one add value to people added value you sell shoes then you need to go back and add value to that store You sell shoes, and you serve hot tea to every customer. That's added value. So I ain't coming for shoes no more, you know. I like the tea you're serving. I can tell everybody, when you go to that store, you get tea. The same funny. I went to a, a massage place the other day. And he's away. And I mean, these people, Lord, this was no massage place. They, they, they treat you like you some king or something. They, they massage you till 30 minutes later. But by, by the time they finish taking care of you, you don't want to leave. And that's their point. They want you to stay because they charge by the hours. You understand? They, they don't want you to come out there. Added value. Number two. Be unique. You barber, fine. Find another way to make your barbering different. Go away and study some new techniques. Come back and say, I'm the only one who got this technique. Or when you come to us, we, we, we serve you cookies and rice or something. In other words, you, you can make something unique about you. Thirdly, quality. How, how, how high a quality? Sometimes quality alone is enough, you know. You sell shoes. That one, that one sells good shoes. They sell better shoes. See, it depends on the quality. Four, attention to details. Come on in, Dr. Monroe. What kind of tea do you like? Hey, I only want to buy a dress. What kind of tea do you like? Yes. And they serve me in a silver cup spoon of gold I only want to drink the tea <laughs> quality details some of y'all can never make it in some expensive restaurants why you take the napkin put it on your lap the fellow say no 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 don't touch that the detail is I put it on your lap for you that's a little detail but it makes everything different it's good for business Four, always offer extra. Always find something extra to give someone. That makes you different. We went to a bank in Florida last week. Walking there. And they said, come on in, come on in, come on in. Uh, would you like some candies? I don't want no candies. But that's, they, they offer them right away. A little extra. We don't want to know what you come for yet. We want to give you something. A little extra. Them candies probably cost, you know, a fraction of a cent each. But it keeps the customer coming. That's worth thousands. 
Number six, service. Service means you don't try to play down here. <laughs> service. That's a whole new ball game. And then I, I, the power of identifying people's needs. Find what people need. That's why I become a good business leader. What are the needs? Needs change. Sometimes people come to you and they, they complain about something that you ain't doing. Take that seriously. They're telling you about a need that ain't being meant. And then number eight, be interested in people. Don't be interested in the bottom line trying to make money. Be interested in people. They'll be interested in you. Sometimes you got to lose something to keep a customer. Lose it. Because things don't come from feelings and hurt. They come from customers. <laughs> All right. Big line. How do you find your gift? I thought you'd wait for this one. Number one, how do you find your gift? How do you know what you were born to do? How do you know the thing that's supposed to make you wealthy? Number one, ask yourself these questions. What is my greatest desire? Go home and study that, please. Take this CD and listen to it. Number two, what do I wish for humanity? Take a bit of M, please. Have you ever sat down and says, I wish somebody would just do this. I wish somebody would just do that. That is your destiny screaming. Why don't somebody do this? In other words, whatever you complain about is what you were born to fix. Number three, what makes you angry? Your gift will always make you angry. It is the thing that makes you angry that you were born to change. If you are get angry at shabby work, I mean, you're supposed to produce best work. You get angry at young people on the street, that means your gift is to go and save young people. Whatever makes you angry is a sign of what you were born to do. Every successful person was an angry person. All of them. Nelson Mandela was angry. So he couldn't be a lawyer anymore. His anger made him leave law and send him to jail. Mahatma Gandhi was angry. He was a lawyer too. Quit law and saved the whole nation, India. Mother Teresa was a teacher, high school teacher. She became angry at poverty in India. Left it, couldn't handle it anymore. Took her last paycheck and bought groceries and gave it to a leper. What makes you angry? Martin Luther King Jr., angry. He was just a preacher, a pastor. His anger drove him into his gift. Malcolm B. Butler Jr. What made him angry? Malcolm Butler. He grabbed that and makes it this, this. I am tired of this. Shoot out of the window. Anger. Free the people. You know what the problem is? You ain't angry enough. Write this down. You will never change what you tolerate. What did I say? I want you to remember that. As long as you tolerate it, you won't change it. You got to get to the point where you can't handle it no more. You know, my anger at third world oppression is what created Miles Monroe. I hate oppression of the people in third world. Whether they're black or white or Asian or Latin, I, I hate it. I hate oppression. I hate it. That's what gave me birth. And I saw what the colonial powers did to my mind. I said, I hate it. And that hatred produced me. What makes you angry? That's why I say I will transform followers and the leaders why because we were born to be leaders but they told us you were born to be a slave that anger is what created this ministry what makes you angry don't look for a job look for your anger what is your deepest passion passion means what do you want to do and never stop doing? Got to find it. Look at number six. Number five, what do you talk, think about when you are alone? Normally, when you are finally quiet and alone, that's when your gift starts talking. You know why you can't find your gift? You with people too much. You got TV on too much. Listening to music too much. Everyone in history, you check them out. Who heard their, their gift? 
was alone. Moses, mountain. Jesus, in the hills. Uh, uh, Elijah, in the cave. Where, where do you hear? We do noisy. Always with friends. Everybody, let's go. Let's, nobody mean let's go. Go alone and listen to your spirit. You'll find your gift. And your gift is where your wealth is, remember. You don't find your gift among friends. You find it among God. Have you ever taken a walk by yourself for a long time? No, you haven't. You always want people with you. Let's go for a walk. No, no, no. Why don't you just go by yourself? Just go by yourself. Say, Lord, me and you going on a gift-finding walk. We're too noisy. What do you think about when you're alone? The question is, are you ever alone? Some of my greatest revelations come in the shower. Why? Ain't nobody in there with me. It's me in the water. God can talk to me. No music, no radio, no talk shows. All this foolishness. I gotta, I gotta hear. That's why my, my life. Be careful the talk shows. They will talk you out of your gift. Shut them off. They rob you of your destiny. And they never solve problems. Number six, what do you wish you could change in your country? If you walk around your country complaining about something that you could change, you were probably born to fix it. Number seven, what would you do if there was no limit to money and resources? What would you spend it on? What would you really do if you had all the money that you could find? Whatever that answer is, that's what you were born to do. And guess what? If you refine it, and document it, and begin to develop it, the money will come to it. Because there's somebody born to finance your dream. The trouble is they can't find it. They can't find the tree. <laughs> Eight, what is your natural gift? Number nine, what would you do without compensation? It's a tough one. Whatever you were born to do is something that you could do and never get paid for it and still be happy. This is why most people are poor, you know. They want to get paid for everything. People who change the world and who become effective never do anything for money. They do it because they love the passion of it. Bill Gates was interested in no money. He wanted to solve the problem of this massive computer that took up a whole room. He said, there's got to be a way to bring DOS, DOS, DOS for them DOS things to, in a simple icon. And the guy said, I'm going to do it. What no money is concerned about? What are you passionate about? People come to me, say, Dr. Munro, I'd like to be like you. I want to learn to teach and, you know, be a public speaker. I say, okay, uh, volunteer to work in the children's church in BFM. Oh, no, 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 I won't be a public speaker. I just give you the answer. Volunteer to go talk to the kids every Sunday. Why? Practice on them. They know when you make a mistake. What you want is you want the money I get. I started teaching Sunday school for nothing. I taught thousands of conferences for nothing. Why? I was refining my gift. I wasn't looking for compensation. You want to be successful? Do it for nothing. Serve your gift. Volunteer. That's how you become great. <laughs> I was talking to one of our IT people today, a young lady, I know she's here. And she said, I said, how long have you been working? She said, I've been working here since 19, sorry, 2008. She said, but you know, Pastor Miles, I used to come here for five years and just volunteer. And one day they just said, you know what you're doing. Why don't you come on the staff? Now she's working in one of the leaders in IT. Would you do that? Or you won't pay the first day? Volunteer. What would you do? And personally sacrifice for it. You normally, when you find your gift, you're willing to put up your house for the business. You're willing to sacrifice the car to invest it in the, in, in the idea. That's sacrifice. 
When we built Bahamas Faith Ministries, I'm telling you what, man, we have nothing. My wife and I had one car. We used to share it. I used to live with my mother-in-law in one room in the house. Why? I ain't gonna get, we ain't got no money to waste. Are you too proud to live with your mother-in-law? So you could save money, so you can put it invested in, 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 in the idea? No? What are you willing to sacrifice? See, some people are willing to die, you know. That's what makes them so powerful. Nelson Mandela was willing to die. Sacrifice. What are you willing to sacrifice for your idea? You may have to sell your house. <laughs> and you view history, these guys, all these big guys you're so you know, jealous of, check them out. They started selling their houses, selling their cars for their idea. They had to sacrifice something because they believed in it more than their own security. Successes and prosperity ain't, a, it ain't magic. It's laws. These are laws. Uh, I was thinking about this year. Find your purpose, find your perception, find your potential, discover your passion, your, live by the principles, create a plan, be with the right people who can influence you to get there. That means choose your friends. Be persistent, because there can be fight. There'll be a fight against it, and then you have to be persevering all the time, because you've got to fight your way to your success. And then, pray. Always spend time with God. He's the one who gave you the plan. You're going to make it happen. I had a, a, a final slide here. Uh, this is what I wanted to show you. Look at number seven. Write number seven down. Serve your gift free at every opportunity. I did that. I did it. Serve your gift free. The more you serve it, the more value you're building. And the day can come and someone gonna say, you know something, I like what you're doing. We're gonna finance your program for the next ten years. But there's watching you, you see. Serve your gift free. At every opportunity. In other words, the greatest act of your prosperity is volunteerism. Volunteer your gift. They'll pay you later. Sign up to serve. You get paid later. It happens to everybody. I love you. I don't want you to fail. I know it's been long, but it's so dangerous out there, you better get this in here. Life is rough out there. I don't want you to be a beggar. You're a great woman. You're an awesome man. You got more on the inside of you that they haven't seen yet. You are not finished. You're still on your way. Wake yourself up. Dust yourself off. Let's go get them. Let's go and become successful without even seeking it.